Good afternoon, everybody, and a very big welcome to all attendees to this webinar today on energy efficiency, cogeneration, and the harnessing of recoverable energy, the cheapest and cleanest opportunity to meet demand. My name is Chris Yelland. I'm the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I'll be your host at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to our presenters who will be introduced to you in due course. I'm also going to share a link with you now on the Zoom chat facility where you can download the presenter biographies. A big welcome to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation. This webinar is hosted by EE Business Intelligence. But I'd like to acknowledge and thank Industrial Water Cooling, Actom John Thompson, the Africa Energy in Daba, Unlimited Energy, and the University of the Witwatersrand for their most valued support and participation in this webinar, and for the great work that they do in this field. About 1,400 delegates have registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered as well as the stature of the presenters. So may I express a big thanks to the presenters for their participation and for the time and effort that they have put in. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be, made, will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send your questions on the Q&A text facility and not on the Zoom chat facility. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally. We've set aside about 30 minutes after the presentation for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. Colleagues, the Minister of Electricity is seized with the execution of plans for additional power and improved energy efficiency through a number of strategies in order to reduce and eliminate load shedding in South Africa. Co-generation, the harnessing of recoverable energy, and improving energy efficiency in utility, industrial, mining, commercial, and residential installations provides the cleanest and least cost opportunities to meet demand. For example, many existing power plants, especially dry cooled power plants, are not generating power at maximum capacity due to weather conditions, as well as design and environmental limitations. Additional megawatts and gigawatts can be harnessed with essentially zero additional carbon dioxide and harmful gas emissions at much lower life cycle costs than any equivalent coal, gas, diesel, nuclear, hydro, or renewable uh, and storage uh, new build capacity. Similarly, meaningful policy in interventions and incentivization of energy in efficiency initiatives at various levels in the public and private sector can make a significant contribution to reducing demand and load shedding at re relatively low cost without negatively impacting on productivity. For example, three of our presenters today, Dr. Theo Kavari, Dr. Jesse Yen, and Professor Ken Nixon will be giving overview summaries of broad energy efficiency policies and specific implementation initiatives for demand management program for water heating technologies to reduce consumption and peak demand. A further in-depth 90-minute presentation on this same subject will be given by them at a Zoom meeting on Monday, the 26th of February at 3 o'clock, 3 p.m., to which you are all cordially invited. A link to download the full presentation that will be given on Monday, the 26th of February at three o'clock, is being shared with you now on the Zoom chat facility. And in addition, a link to join the Zoom meeting on Monday, the 26th of February at three o'clock, is also being shared with you now. You are most welcome to attend the meeting on Monday for the full detailed presentation by Theo, Jesse, and Ken. This webinar will show that investing in improved asset performance and plant operation 
and installing new optimized technologies to increase efficiency at all levels will yield the cleanest and most economical solutions to meet demand and reduce load shedding. The objectives of this webinar are to explore the policies, opportunities, technologies, costs, and financing options, and to give examples of, as to how power generation and other plants and commercial and residential buildings can be converted to increase energy efficiency and harness and maximize recoverable energy. The program for the day has been widely circulated, but a link to download the program will be shared again now here on the Zoom chat facility. Rudy Dix in the Office of the Presidency will make the opening address and also give a few insights on the subject at hand. I think Rudy is well known to most of us here. He heads the National Energy Crisis Committee and the Project Management Office in the Presidency. He's also responsible for supporting implementation of the Presidential Jobs uh, Summit Framework Agreement, the Youth Employment Initiative, and unblocking regulatory challenges impacting employment and economic growth. Rudy was a DDG in the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, responsible for monitoring the performance of economic and infrastructure departments, supporting various interventions across government. Before 2008, Rudy worked at Kosatu and one of its affiliates in various capacities. He studied at the Witz Business School and completed the Advanced Management Program and has a postgraduate diploma in economic principles as well as a Master of Science in Finance from the University of London. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Rudy Dix for the opening address. Rudy, over to you now. Thank you, Chris, for that warm welcome. Um, thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> so is am I clear? You are clear, Rudy. A little bit... Um... Uh, I think there's a little bit of a bandwidth problem, but you're coming across clearly. So please proceed. Okay, sorry, man. I'm just having challenges with energy as it is, as you can well imagine. Would it be better? <laughs> would it be better for me to switch off my camera since everybody has now seen me? If that's okay. Um, yes, that's fine. Okay, wonderful. So thanks. I'm not an expert, Matt, on this, but as Chris has pointed out. Um, I, I do coordinate the Secretariat of the National Energy Crisis Committee, and I think a lot of the work that we've done in a way has allowed Chris and colleagues that are participating in this webinar and in other webinars to, be, to begin to explore on some of the opportunities that have not been there or have been in an ad hoc arrangement. I, I recall some of the conversations around co-generation through the standard um, Sorry, to the short-term power purchase agreements that were initiated in the um, you know 2014, 2015 cycle of load shedding, if you recall, but always add up. I think the since the just a reminder, Chris. I mean, since the announcement by the president of the Energy Action Plan in July 2022, the opportunities have been immense, and particularly the opportunities for private sector to be able to um, advance and are able to. Uh, look at various interventions to support a uh, meeting and addressing the energy challenge. EAP, again, fundamentally, as we all know, has two key interventions. Um, uh, lots of critique, of course, on the first one, but it's the one where um, we are still relying overwhelmingly, 80% of it and more, on the generation capacity uh, of ESCOM um, and uh, the relatively aging Power, coal power fleet over there. Um, but the opportunities that the Energy Action Plan and the reform program has created, we've seen a whole set of other interventions where additional generation capacity from all forms of technology have been able to put onto the grid. And I think that for us is the most important part. If you think about it, a lot of the reform, particularly around the private sector, uh, participation in the implementation of the um, uh, of the EAP uh, was not really, in a sense, taken quite seriously until we've done quite a bit of the tweaks, for example, on Schedule 2 in the era as it currently stands. And of course, fundamentally institutionalizing that through the amendments in the 
actual bill that is currently before parliament and being processed by the National Assembly and the National Council of the Provinces. So again, what were those five key elements of the EAP? Firstly, as I've, as I've indicated, uh, fundamentally to, to, um, you know, to support the recovery of its existing generation fleet and to support um, the ability for us to be able to improve plant performance. The second and more fundamental one was the ability for us to be able to completely overhaul the system and allow for private sector generation uh, to, um, uh, to uh, become available on the grid, not in a limited form as we saw, um, where you know the thresholds that we introduced have now completely been eliminated. Um, and a lot of that has seen, for instance, you know, more than 120 projects that we track from NECOM, um, totaling just over 12 gigawatts. Now, I know, of course, we have different data points. You can talk about the registration points that NERSA has, which is just over 6,000. Um, if one goes to the GAU, the grid access unit, and you look at the data points around the applications for data generation or the private sector components of it, not the IPP programs, you have over 18,000, but we track, generally speaking, and given the evidence that is, has been provided in the many surveys, we think that's the kind of indication that's there. Now, that's phenomenal, given the fact that that was not there two years. The fact also is that this has spurred significant investment in renewable energy, totaling uh, uh, cost estimates of the, uh, we, 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 if we use the, the, the cost per megawatt that was procured by the IPP program, it roughly comes to an estimate of about 220 billion rand worth of investment that is expected to come on and some that have already come on or come on over the next two to, to three years. So certainly the opportunity there, although many have taken up the opportunities through embedded generation, through building you know, their own power plants, certainly from a co-generation um, and uh, energy efficiency in the in Uh, we seem to have lost you um, there, Rudy. Uh, perhaps you can switch off your camera and see if the bandwidth improves. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we seem to have lost Rudy. His connection has dropped. Uh, I can't um, uh, see or hear him further. So I think at this point, uh, we may bring Rudy in a little later, if possible. Uh, but let us rather now move on to our first presenter whilst uh, Rudy tries to sort out those technical issues. Rudy, I see you're back again. Ah, Would you sorry like about to carry that. on? Yes, no load shedding ended. I'm still one of the I'm still one of the old style uh, people that um, you know haven't invested yet in a rooftop PV or into inverter yet. So unfortunately, I have candles and and lots of torches with batteries running around, but it's during the day. So my apologies. So, so my apologies for that. Um, the, 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 the third element is, of course, ensuring that we have a successful IPP program that continues, particularly in renewables. Again, battery storage, and of course, you've seen now more recently gas. Third element is rooftop, and you see some phenomenal data that has come out of there of the PV rooftop. Unfortunately, of course, in the budget yesterday, that... Um, uh, that incentive will not continue, although the incentive for uh, 12B for businesses will continue, and I think that's quite critical. And more importantly, the most important part of institutionalizing the reform that we started in July 2022 is the, um, the irritable and the work that we're doing around the reform for the entire electricity sector, um, moving it away from a single buy model to um, a model where we see a significant competition setting up of a uh, a, a independent transmission entity that would have a whole set of different functions. Um, more importantly, it would be, um, um, you know, set up a central purchasing agency and, of course, um, um, be responsible for a whole set of market operators operations, and that's going to be quite critical. So this has been an important area, and I think, Chris, um, I mean, we value the fact that, that part of that has allowed, for example, a whole set of agnostic technologies and interventions and support from the private sector by simply doing some of those interventions and reforms that has been quite critical. So for me, that's an important context and I think it's quite critical for us to institutionalize 
and you show that that does happen. Now, um, the role of the private sector has always been important for us, and that's been the most important change since we've done the, in, um, the Energy Action Plan. The ability for us to cooperate and work in the National Economic uh, um, Crisis Committee, for the National Energy Crisis Committee, we of course have colleagues from the private sector who are working with us on a whole set of different things. We're working on unblocking and ensuring we get permits and authorizations. But more importantly, we've been able to introduce a whole set of new programs supported by ESCOM, for instance, <clears throat> that is intended to unlock a lot of what we're going to talk about later on in the program. Standard offer purchase, for example, a technology agnostic, which looks at co-generation and energy efficiencies, where, of course, the byproduct, like in, in much of what you're going to engage on, is energy that could be put either back into the system or back onto the grid and can be purchased. Um, when we started out, I think one of the things that was um, a really uh, a great concern was whether there was sufficiently um, adequate, uh, uh, you know, incentive for the private sector to, to involve in the two variations of the standard of a purchase program. And I think today we can, uh, you know, thankfully say, um, and part of that cooperation with the private sector, we have close on to 1,200 megawatts through the standard offer program. Another agnostic, um, techno agnostic technology program that will soon be launched and that you've seen um, have been applied for by NERSDA is the load shedding reduction program. Again, the opportunities for the private sector to be able to harness, the uh, harness and invest in their technology and participate in these various programs are going to be quite pertinent and important for us going forward. At the end of the day, what we want is a collaborative effort to reduce load shedding and to end, end it eventually. A lot of work has been done on that, but already <coughs> towards the end of last year, we began to see much of the indicators moving in the right direction, albeit slow, and albeit the, the sudden um, uh, I'll bite the sudden um, blip that we had with the unfortunate uh, stage six load shedding. Um, we continue to have to monitor and we continue to have to improve the plant performance. We think that the partnership is going to be quite critical for us to be able to ensure that we can reduce the energy shortage and have the private sector cooperate and collaborate with the with the um, with with the public sector in the way that we've already shown over the last two and a half years. Lastly. And in conclusion, I think what is quite important also is that as part of the energy efficiency introduction and part of the debt relief program, the National Treasury, again, as you saw in the budget, has allocated 2 billion rand towards and part of the energy efficient by introducing a support program for smart meters. Very interesting program that has been done, for example, a pilot that has been running four ways in Riverside around introducing smart meters that lower the ampage, of course, and introduces, um, you know, um, an ability for households to manage the, um, the uh, electricity consumption between stages one and four. This is important technology that is driven by the private sector. And of course, part of that partnership is to expand that. So thanks, Chris, for inviting me. Um, thanks for allowing me to say a couple of open remarks and setting the scene from a policy director. We have, and I believe we've shown that um, we're moving in the right direction. We have to institutionalize and take forward the reform of ensuring that we create a competitive market space in the generation area. This is an important um, webinar that you have, um, you, you are having and many others of you know, enhancing that ability of the private sector to compete and for it to be able to sell generation capacity at the least cost. Um, and that's quite critical for us going forward. We need to bring down the cost, we need to ensure that we collaborate, and we need to create the competitive generation space. Thanks, Chris. Well, thank you, Rudy, for those uh, words of contextualization and explaining uh, some of the initiatives of the uh, National uh, Energy Crisis Committee. I find it very encouraging uh, to see, uh, firstly, the increased attention that has been given uh, to this longstanding problem, uh, but also the 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 more open engagement uh, with a wide range of stakeholders, both public and private sector, uh, to deal with the problem. It's only by working together, uh, all of us, uh, that, that we can really address this problem and bring on the solutions that we're going to be talking about today. So we're now going to start taking a deep dive into really the subject matter of this webinar itself.
Uh, and it's my great pleasure now to introduce our first presenter. I'm not going to read out his full CV because it has been shared with you on the chat facility. You can click on the link there and download the PDF document, print it out or save it uh, as you may wish. Uh, but I'd like to introduce now Professor Hanno Rieta, uh, who is the Head of Consulting and Research and Development at IWC, Industrial Water Cooling. Uh, and just to say briefly that Hanno joined IWC as the Head of Consulting and R&D. He's a mechanical engineer with a BEng, MEng, and PhD degrees from Stellenbosch University. The rest of his uh, bio is, uh, you know, been shared with you already. Uh, so I'd like to now hand over to uh, Hanno to give his presentation. Over to you, Hanno. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for this opportunity uh, to present um, a great passion of mine. Um, the whole topic of energy efficiency has been, um, and, and uh, um, in technology improvement has been the core of my research over many years now. Um, to start off, um, I want to show you the wonderful system we've developed. No, certainly not. This is a, a, a picture of, of a power plant um, that I don't know how it works, but in any case, it should grab your, your imagination. Um, so, um, my outline of my, my topic or my, my presentation, give you a short introduction. Um, I'll, I'll discuss the impact. Of my, my background, as you can see, is, is cooling. I've designed power plants in whole, but uh, I've specialized in, in cooling, dry and wet cooling. Um, so I'll be discussing, um, mainly focusing on cooling, the impact of it on, on power plant performance, um, potential enhancement for some of South Africa's large power plants. Um, I came up with a simple procedure, just how one could develop recoverable energy power generation. And um, some of the main challenges I, I am facing, or I believe, want to discuss um, concerning financing and why environmentalists, I've actually changed it in the, in the presentation, why everyone should be listening. I think um, uh, people are sometimes blinded um, by, by media and, and, and um, uh, um, emotion. So um, to start off, um, what is the best power generation system? And um, it's not necessarily a renewable system. Um, it's a dispatchable, well, the order it doesn't need to be like this, but it's, it's preferably a dispatchable system that with least negative environmental impact, least cost unit power output, and um, ultimately aesthetically to, pleasing to look at. Um, so um, what we're looking at here today is, is mainly thermal power generation. Um, so that's associated mainly with gas turbines, or, or in our case, the, demo, the, the cases that I want to present are uh, steam power generation. And, and um, we're looking at enhancement of, of uh, these thermal plants. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown of what, it, what is the meaning of energy efficiency improvement, generation, harnessing of recoverable energy, and capacity factor improvement. I've rearranged this sli um, slightly um, after I, I've, I've, I've categorized or um, prioritized a bit. Um, so what is a thermal power plant or power generation um, which helps for the dispatchable power? It's effectively a system. It could be a, there are a variety of power plants, uh, but it converts one form of primary input heat energy, um, which could be solar, biomass, hydrogen, nuclear, which are considered to be green energy sources, or it converts uh, brown or gray energy sources like gas, coal, oil uh, into electricity. Um, so um, when we have a power plant, it's designed uh, to convert a certain amount of heat into electricity. Um, and uh, typically, the conversion rates or efficiencies are between uh, 30 and 60 percent. That means 60 percent or 30 percent of the heat going in is converted to electric power. And this conversion, this is where a lot can be done to actually uh, improve on on, on uh, the conversion rate. So the first um, enhancement that I that I would like to discuss is probably the main problem South Africa has, and that is we we have a very low capacity factor on our plants due to Images due to uh, older technology, uh, etc. So basically, our first priority would be uh, to, to um, increase the capacity factor. So I, I heard this week um, our availability is 52 percent. That means we've got capacity, but only 50 percent ultimately is 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 uh, utilized. So there's 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 uh, um, uh, you know investment or, or um, assets that are not utilized properly. 
So to effectively get this up, it requires operation, investment, maintenance, and refurbishment. So um, we are involved in some of these projects on on the clean tower side, refurbishing them, and hopefully we can we can bring these plants up. So the next um, uh, enhancement is is a different concept. It's uh, so capacity factor enhancement is also a form of energy efficiency enhancement, uh, but to enhance efficiency, uh, one actually maintains and, and repairs and refurbishes the plant so that you get the best conversion rate from en heat energy to electricity. So it's, to me, um, a specific definition, which I want to define in this way. It's, it's effectively to get the plant as close as possible to the way it's designed. And during operation, uh, tubes get uh, fouled or, or dirty, the cooling towers get fouled, um, tube leaks, et cetera, et cetera. And these must be kept uh, maintained um, to maximize the efficiency of the plant at maximum conversion rate. Um, and that, that's the cleanest this plant can be uh, if, it's, if it's done optimally, optimally. Then there's the topic of cogeneration and hybridization. So the way I see it is it's effectively, if you have a power plant, one can uh, convert it uh, to um, take on, instead of just having coal or gas or oil, to take on solar, biomass, hydrogen partially as well. And then another way of, of um, utilizing energy uh, effectively is, um, so electric power is, is, is an output, but instead of just having waste heat, also um, using this, the, the heat in a, a useful way. Um, I was quite involved in, in plants in the Middle East where this heat was used for water desalination, as an example, or, or for large uh, process plants. So this is my, my main um, uh, topic that I, I would like to share with you. Um, so um, harnessing of recoverable energy, this is a word that I, I must uh, give to Professor Nikos van Nikak, something that I, I really liked. Um, so effectively, the way I see it is, is if you have a power plant and it's up, operating to the best of its, its uh, capability, then we can actually invest in improved uh, systems or components that allow us to harness more electric power um, out of that plant. And, and I see this to be equivalent of building a new green power plant. Because essentially, you don't have any more combustion or fluid gases than you would have had, but you're getting more electricity out. Um, so, so this is a concept um, that, I, that I would want to share with you and discuss. Um, so um, a power plant can have various shapes and sizes, but um, we have quite a few of these in South Africa. This is um, ESCOM Matumba ACC. I just took it because it's, uh, it is, I have a nice photo of it. But um, typically in South Africa, we have these six six pack units. So it's a it's a dirty coal fired fired power plant. Um, it has six boilers. You see, these are the boilers here. So they con um, convert that uh, combustion energy into steam. That passes through a steam turbine, which is at the back here, and then that uh, steam exits the turbine after expansion and is condensed in this large cooling system. So this is called the cold end, and that's just, that's where I am at. Uh, um, this is my field of specialization. So, so to to make it simple for you, so the cold end is is an end which can be exploited, or a, a part of the power plant that can be exploited significantly. Um, and and um, what I've got here is is just to show you, this is your steam turbine. So steam comes in from steam uh, heat recovery, steam generator, or a, a boiler, and then at high pressure and temperature, and it expands in the turbine. And it leaves at a low pressure. So that steam then uh, passes into a cooling system. And, and I want to discuss the air cool condenser because it, it shows the, 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 the largest gains um, and, and most interesting to, to view. But the, the principles that I'm sharing are applicable to, to any type of cooling system. So the steam comes out and it's at a saturated condition. So the pressure and the temperature are related. Um, um, so um, it condenses in this. A frame sort of structure with thin tubes inside thin tubes. So um, these thin tubes are cooled by air, and um, you'll see this is, um, there's a fan that's uh, in this air cooled heat exchanger, and it it blows the air across these these thin tubes. Um, so when you design a plant, it uh, uh, swallows a certain amount of steel, condenses a certain amount of steam at a given temperature. So that's that's part of the design. So what we found is that. Um, when you reduce this, this pressure or the temperature of the steam by about one degree, you can get up to 0.4, between 0.4 to 1% increase in power output or efficiency. That's significant. But that also tells us that this system 
it very closely follows the ambient, uh, the, the, the steam temperature or steam exhaust uh, pressure follows the ambient temperature. So if we, for instance, um, have zero degrees Celsius, um, uh, at, the ambient is at zero degrees Celsius, um, or it's at 40 degrees, this, that steam temperature will vary by about 40 degrees. Um, and if you see one degree Celsius to two, three degrees Celsius gives you 1%. That's dramatic. Um, so dry cool power plants are very sensitive to ambient conditions. And then another thing comes uh, with it, um, that is they are also sensitive to wind. So when the wind blows, um, the performance of these plants is, is negatively impacted. Um, and a lot of research has been done at Dillenbosch University to investigate all aspects of these, um, um, these, these air cooled condensers. So just to quickly show you, this is typically a thin tube inside which the steam condensers. Uh, it's a flat tube, steam is inside, and then air passes on the outside through fins which are brazed on the surface. So these are carbon steel tubes, aluminum fins. Um, I must say this is not the technology that's been installed in South Africa, but um, this was developed in South Africa. So um, I've shown you the, the dry cooled system. So here I'm just showing you the um, combined dry wet system. Um, and this is my this is what I'm driving. Um, I believe that by combining the dry and wet cooling, one can get the best of both worlds. One can save water and you can uh, uh, maximize efficiency. So the difference is uh, usually in South Africa, we have either or system. So either a dry cooled or a wet cooled. In the dry cooled, as I've explained, steam goes to the condenser. Um, in the wet cooled, the steam goes to a surface condenser, which is a bundle of tubes. And on the inside, you have cold water um, that is cooled by an evaporative cooling system, which is called a evaporative cooling tower. So um, the steam condensers on the outside of the tubes, the water heats up and it is then, uh, it circulated to a cooling tower, it's sprayed into the air to allow it to evaporate. And this gives us a very compact and, and highly efficient cooling system, uh, which can cool down the steam at to much lower temperatures than you would get uh, in, 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 in the case of uh, um, a dry cool system. So um, the concept that I'm, that I'm sharing is, is one where um, if one has a dry cooled system, um, if one would add some wet cooling, um, that would benefit the system dramatically. Um, especially at these high ambient temperatures and, and when the wind blows. Um, so this is where a lot of research has gone in to find systems that, that can do this. So here is just an example of what, what this would look like in, in practice. So this is Kusile. These are auxiliary cooling towers, but this is typically how much one would need to boost an air-cooled condenser unit, which you see here. This is a, a large, the large one, one of the steam turbine units as, as an air-cooled condenser, which is this size. It's about 50 meters from the ground to these fans. Um, I've got some numbers on fans just now, but um, but um, where everything started for me was I was involved in Majuba Power Station, the design of uh, units four, five, and six. And this plant, and and this is, should justify what I'm saying. It's 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 clear information out there. It's it's a six pack unit, and it's three of these units are dry cooled, and the other three are wet cooled. And I always wondered, okay, if you look at the, the output, um, there's a ten percent difference in output between wet cooled and dry cooled. Um, and um, so I use this um, to, to investigate, just to give you some perspective on, on what that means. So if, if um, this is a fully wet cooled, and this is a purely dry cooled uh, side of the, 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 the plant, one, two, and three dry, four, five, and six is wet cooled. So if you look at um, the comparison between a dry and a wet cooled power plant, so, so what I've done here, um, this, this plant has identical boilers, so to speak. So the only thing that's different is the cooling system. The steam turbine a little bit, and the generator, of course, is is is, is different. But um, if you look at the difference between the wet cooling towers with the same boiler design, same fuel consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, and and the ACCs, then essentially you have no water, and that's important for South African context. But sometimes we do have a bit of water, but we're only looking at it as we don't have water. So at Majuba, you see there are two systems: one without water and one with water. That indicates that there is some water. Um, in any case, um, so. They don't use any water, and a wet cooled system uses a lot of water. So it's between 1.5 and 2.5 liters per kilowatt hour. Um, if you look at the two plants at design conditions, which is usually around the average ambient temperature um, uh, of the year, um, a, uh, a wet cooled plant will produce up to 10% more, or a dry cooled plant will produce up to 10% less power output um, than a wet cooled plant. And as the temperatures go up to say 40 degrees for Matamba, for instance, you have 20% less power output. And I'll give you the numbers just now. 
And when the wind decides to blow on the on that hot day from the wrong direction, units trip and you end up with up to 35% relative to a wet cool plant. 35% on a big number is a is a big number. So um so yeah, just to show you what we've got in South Africa in terms of dry cooled, um, in the southern Africa, we have Fund Eck, which is a small plant. Then we started building these large plants. Kendall is a dry cooled indirect plant, but it's six times 686 megawatts. Um, Marapula is a small plant. One of the A plant was four times 33 megawatts. Then Matimba was a world record. It's, it seemed to be an engineering feat um, of, uh, at the time. Um, the largest plant in the world, um, and six times 665 megawatts, largest dry cooled plant. And then Majuba, similar, uh, small Elgin plant. Marapula, again, smallish plant, but four times 150. Then the, the uh, CSP plants started coming in, 100 megawatts, 50 megawatts for Key, um, Ilanga, 100 megawatts. And then you see here some of the big plants everyone's talking about, Madupi. Uh, six times 800 megawatts. Uh, Kutile, six times 800 megawatts. And then Redstone is another um, um, uh, CSP plant. So in total, we have 223.2 megawatts or 23.2 gigawatts of power uh, plant the, that are dry cooled. Um, and I'm, I'm giving you a number, 10% of that is 2.3 gigawatts. Um, if you look at these renewable plants, it's only 100 megawatts here, 100 megawatts. And if you look at the size and the cost of these plants, it's astronomical, typically $8,000, $7,500 uh, per megawatt installed. Um, so this is a number that I'll continue with. So you've, you heard, you saw that I was talking about 10% between dry and wet, another 10% between cold, uh, hot and, and cold. So um, you see that we're going into the gigawatts here. So these plants that we've got are, um, um, I just want to see, I can't see the number here now, but um. Uh, it's got Matimba, just to show, this is just another picture. It's got 48 times six fans, large auxiliary power consumption on these. Um, then here you see, this is Madupi at 64 times six, uh, 384 fans. Each fan is a 34 foot fan with typically six to eight blades um, with the same wingspan as a Cessna 172, I think. Um, these are massive rotating blades up in the sky. They are big plants, infrastructure that's there. Um, not necessarily working optimally. Here's just to show um, some new technology which has been built at Redstone, um, which is induced draft air cooled condenser technology and some technology that we've developed in South Africa, uh, which combines air cooled condenser and, and wet cooling. If you want to know more, then contact me. And then this is um, what I just wanted to present. So this is a system we developed um, that that effectively is a, is, replaces a surface condenser, uh, all the water piping and and uh, the cooling tower. It's all in one in 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 one structure. It's called a, a, a induced draft hybrid condenser. We call it a hybrid deflagmator. Um, and you see the one one fan unit like this. It, it comprises of here. You see the bundle similar to the air cooled con or the the surface condenser, steam pipes, and then water that gets recirculated over this. This is an evaporative cooling system that can be operated in dry mode as well. So. What um, we want to show is, is when one starts thinking about hybrid and, and uh, dry wet, um, then when I've done a few calculations for different companies, for plants in Canada, in, in Belgium, in South Africa. And um, what I found is, is that if one combines dry and wet technology, one can actually get up to a 50% reduction in water and get the same efficiency as a wet good plant, which is dramatic. Then if you look at just one of those fan units, it's equivalent to about 46 ACC fan modules. So those large A-frames. So it's, it's a high boost, it's called, we call it a, a supercharger for cooling. Um, then if you look at um, uh, Matimba, uh, we believe that we can, we can increase the performance by about 10% at high temperatures. If you see at a high temperature, I've got the generator capacity steam turbine. I just can't because of constraints on the design, I can't meet them. So, up to 400 megawatts, and when the when the wind blows and we have trips and things, there's a thousand megawatt that's up for grabs. So um, we can increase that um, by just adding four, perhaps four cooling towers or these uh, these evaporative condensers. Um, so definitely something to look at because uh, it, it's, it's in large numbers. Then we can get between 2.5 percent or 100 megawatt on average for that plant. Um, and uh, on most of the the, the 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 projects that we've worked on. Payback periods are between two and five years. I've even, for, for EDF, 
even one year in one case. So, um, um, so if you look at um, other ways of improving performance is to improve the fans. Um, so um, the fans uh, currently at Matumba, they are doing that. They're replacing the fans with fans that are more efficient. And there you get a few megawatts out, um, but you get a lot of operational improvement. So, so there, there's some benefits there. And the cost is 600 US dollars per kilowatt, which is, which is much lower than, than building a new plant. Also, the wind is, is, is an issue. Um, and uh, when the wind blows, um, for, for some of the plants we've investigated, you can get up to a 3% increase in power output when, in some cases when the wind blows. And, and the cost is in the order of 300 US dollars per kilowatt. So that's just, uh, um, quite dramatic. So um, what the problem seems to be is uh, what we've done now is, is, is we, we go to, to, um, to, to clients and, and we want to find a way of implementing this. And it's difficult to, to get, get uh, clients on board. But um, the, the main thing is we need to get a baseline for, for, the, for, the, for the plant so that we do by doing annual, annual uh, measurements. And, and um, then we model the performance. Uh, we design and install a retrofit solution and retest. And, and from that, you get the deviations and, and you can calculate your, your, um, your, your finances and effectively the economics. But the challenges that I believe are there in, in, the, in, the, in, in financing these sort of projects is, um, firstly, there's an international moratorium on financing of any project associated with fossil fuels or conventional power. And that's an issue um, because any system that's associated with, with uh, a great energy is, is not is, is seen as frowned upon. Um, revenue models differ between renewables and, and, and this recoverable energy. Why? Can one not get them closer together, be comparable? And then uh, risks of retrofitting operational plants, that's an issue. So these plants are large, they're operational, There's a, they shouldn't um, lose uh, um, out output. Um, and then obviously there's the uncertainty regarding future of co um, conventional power. But to, to conclude, I think everyone should pay attention to, to, to this um, Sort of approach because um, the negative impact of neglecting or ignoring optimal performance of existing thermal power plants can be much greater than positive impact of building renewable plants at much higher cost. So e energy efficiency and capacity factor improvement, co-generation and harnessing of recoverable energy is dispatchable, cleaner and more economical than any new build technology. It should be incentivized in a similar manner as, as renewable energy systems by means of maybe a feed-in tariff or something in that order or, or something which we can discuss. And, and the other thing is, I believe, um, dry, just wet, just renewable. Uh, I, I think one should look at hybridizing plants, um, which is holistically, arguably, the best option, especially during periods of uh, transition, the greener power. Um, so, so, yes, that, uh, that wraps up my, my presentation. Um, and I look forward to some questions from the floor. Thank you very much, Hanno. You've given us a lot to think about um, uh, with this hybrid wet dry cooling solutions. If I can ask you to stop sharing your presentation, yes. Um, yes. it's been a, a very thought provoking presentation uh, on initiatives that can deliver a really significant uh, amount of power, really significant without any increase in carbon emissions uh, and, uh, and, and no increase in fuel consumption. In other words, it doesn't increase uh, you know, a need for more fuel. It just harnesses what we've already got in a more efficient uh, way. As I say, I agree with you that this is clean energy. <laughs> it, it is uh, extra power and no extra pollution. Uh, yes. and no extra carbon emissions. So thank you very much for, for that. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce our second presenter, who is Dr. Brad Rawlins. He's a design engineer at Actom John Thompson. Uh, and as a design engineer, he brings a wealth of knowledge in modeling and simulation of cogeneration plants to maximize energy efficiency. He has an MSc degree and a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Cape Town. So over to you, Brad. We're looking forward to hearing uh, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So, yeah, let me get yeah, started. Um, let's get started here. Okay, so, yeah, this presentation, we're just going to go over an overview. And, yeah, so I'll be touching on some of the points relating to, yeah, cogeneration, harnessing recoverable energy by use of waste heat technologies, uh, the engineering considerations when considering these technologies, and yeah, just some examples that of industrial applications, which yeah, John Thompson 
has implemented in the past or be, been a part of. Yeah, so yeah, cogeneration, that yeah, just refers to the system that generates your yeah, usable heat and electrical energy. A good example in the South African context is your is the sugar bills or the sugar industry, which utilize the byproduct of your sugar making process, namely the gas, which is just your yeah, crushed sugar cane as your fuel source. This fuel source, well, is burnt and liberated, the liberated heat energy is transferred well, transformed to a usable pressure such heat energy in the form of steam. And this is allowed to expand through your turbine to generate electricity. And part of the process is there's a usable heat energy section, which would typically be used for uh, your process applications. Uh, examples of that is drying heating of in the factory itself, or it can be used to improve the boiler efficiency, resulting in a reduction of the fuel consumption. And an example of this is to use, well, in the use of feed water heaters, uh, steam air heaters, and the like. So yeah, advantages, as I mentioned, are that the overall thermal efficiency of the system increases uh, with yeah, the cogeneration plant. And yeah, cogeneration plants, they are a form of recovering usable energy from a waste source. And thus, a lot of what I'm going to be discussing in your, well, in the waste heat boiler section, which follows, is just the applicable well, is also applicable to your cogeneration plants. So now your waste heat recovery systems, they you know, rely on capturing your, your heat energy that is you know, discarded and utilize it for either your power generation, or as mentioned in the cogeneration process, um, to use as a usable heat for a particular process uh, to increase the energy efficiency of the plant. So the schematic that's you know, presented there just illustrates the power generation option so heat is recovered using some sort of working fluid in a heat recovery boiler. This is allowed to expand through a turbine and generate your electrical power. And then that working fluid will be condensed again and to be used in the cycle again. So now this cycle is known as a Rankine cycle and typically we're using steam as our working fluid. This is the most common in industry and our power generation sector, um, steam, be steam being the most economically um, viable. So. However, for waste heat boilers or so, the temperature of our waste stream plays a very important role. So with low temperatures being far less efficient when using steam as your working fluid. And now to make use of any low temperature energy source, so at the organic Rankin cycles being developed or was as you know, is in operations, are typically you know, utilized for your better efficiencies at these lower temperatures. The, in this instance, uh, your steam is replaced by an organic medium. Examples of that are like refrigerants, uh, butane, a mixture of ammonia and steam or water. Okay, so the efficiency of any of, well, of the energy extraction from your waste energy source is dependent, as I mentioned, on the temperature of the source. So now these energy sources, they can be categorized into your high, medium or low energy sources. Whereas your high to medium energy sources are typical of your power generation, cogeneration plants. Um, they use a lot of, they produce energy to improve the thermal efficiency, as I mentioned with your feed water heaters and steam air heaters. Whereas your low energy sources are identified as energy that is you know, not viable for any process or so because of the temperature and are typically expelled to atmosphere or large heat sink or condenser. So an example is the exhaust gases before your scrubbers of a biomass plant coming out yeah, so then this table just presents uh, some of the predefined temperature limits of your grades of each energy source. So we can see for your high and medium um, energy sources, so it makes sense to make use of a waste heat boiler to generate your steam uh, to expand through the turbine, or a turbine or any process uh, that, that heat might be needed. Whereas your lower end of the medium to your low energy sources, they call for other technologies to capture the heat in an efficient manner. Yeah, this just further, well, this table just further refines uh, the potential low-grade energy sources with a typical range of temperatures for you know, what's found in industry. It's important to note that when dealing with any gas compositions or so, well, gases, it's, it's important to note the composition. Uh, this is, needs to be considered because you, know, you would want to you know, protect your heat exchanging equipment, uh, yeah, especially in the case of yeah, approaching the dew point temperature, you can get yeah, moisture and if there's sulfur dioxide and nitrous, nitric dioxides in there, you get um, acid formation, which will negatively affect any of your heat exchanges. 
So <clears throat> when considering the implementation of somehow waste heat or recoverable, recoverable energy sources, there are a few important factors um, that should be considered, namely the availability of the waste stream. You know, is it continuous, cyclic, intermittent? You know, this is going to affect, um, well, tell us about what the annual operating hours um, this plant will be in. Um, what state your waste um, heat stream is in? Is it a gas, solid, liquid? Uh, and with gas, what's the composition, as I've mentioned previously? And then your important engineering factors is, um, does the temperature, flow rate, or pressure vary over time in order to effectively design, come up with a design solution for that? Um, so yeah, in terms of the John Thompson implementation, we have two main departments yeah, that yeah, designed and can design for waste heat applications. Namely, that's our water tube and fire tube division. So the choice of, the choice of technology would yeah, be highly dependent on yeah, the previously mentioned considerations and what you know, the client or so wants. And then the difference between the two technology is primarily that your water tube boiler systems, uh, this is where the water is inside of the tubes, while a fire tube boiler, the fire is inside of the tube, so your hot flue gases. Yeah, so presented here is you know, an implementation where we had open gas cycle where a waste heat recovery system was installed that utilized the hot gas, uh, the hot um, exhaust gases for your energy recovery to run a small scale steam turbine. So note this is using a high medium to high energy source uh, with an expected continuous operation. So you know the result was an increase in our overall efficiency because you're yeah, using a lot more of the energy in the process. And this the setup is quite a common setup for any open gas cycles that run continuously or so. Another yeah, example was for copper smelting plants up in Zambia. So this uses your high, high temperature flue gas from your smelter to produce steam for some downstream processes. Again, we have a medium to high energy source uh, with a intermittent to yeah, almost constant or continuous operation cycle. This made use of some of the Alstom boiler technology uh, that you know, has online um, cleaning for the radiative and convection section. So interestingly enough, uh, there's some copper compounds that are present in your flue gas um, going through this um, heat recovery cycle. And yeah, so it, it was also able to recover basically some of the um, copper com compounds for further refining via the use of that online cleaning um, implementation in these boilers. And yeah, so this table is just a very condensed partial list of some of the waste heat boilers and co-generation plants that John Thompson has been involved with, either through the design, the commissioning of, or operation thereof. Yeah, so no, none of some of them are to produce power and others were to increase the efficiency of um, systems and processes to provide process steam for factories. And yeah, finally, the market barriers, you know, between anything, between um, implementating, implementation of such technologies, you can categorize them into basically three groups, which all cross over at some point, namely your technical aspects. Now this is to do what I have you know, primarily focused the discussion around. So what is the appropriate technology to use, the availability of your waste heat, um, what, what's waste product, um, the energy potential, and some practical implications are your space limits, space limits on sites, on site, if there's enough space you know, on a site or so. Um, then your business barriers typically to do with the associated risks, risks of either new technology or retrofitting existing technology. And then also to do with financing the projects or finding the motivation to secure finding, financing. And then your regulatory uh, barriers are your governing bodies regulating such things as your power purchase agreements, emissions controls, and the likes. And you can see with the technical and regulatory, yeah, you know, so the technology will, will overlap with your emission control in order to get the optimal design. And yeah, so that's that's the end of my presentation. And back to you, Chris. Oh, thank you very much indeed uh, for that presentation, Brad. Uh, it's given us some interesting insights into the work that John Thompson boilers do. Uh, and uh, the retrofitting uh, applications for, for uh, waste heat recovery uh, and also the use of uh, waste fuels. Uh, so thanks very much for that. And uh, you've been very kind uh, and recovered some time. We were running a little bit 
over time before, but now we are back on time. Uh, and I'd like to now um, call a 10 minute comfort break uh, so that people can stretch their legs and have a, a cup of coffee or tea to, to drink. Um, so it, it's now uh, about five to one, five to one. So I'm going to call a comfort break now until five past one. That is 13.05, 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, we got two, two uh, great uh, presentations still to come, uh, followed by a Q&A session uh, discussion, as well as a wrap up by uh, Brian Statham uh, with some of his own insights as to what we, we've heard today. And uh, it's my great pleasure now to uh, restart this webinar and to introduce our next presenter, who is uh, Dr. Theo Kovari. And he is a director at Unlimited Energy Solutions. So for the last 20 years, uh, Theo has targeted his efforts on the energy transition policy development and project implementation with a primary focus on energy efficiency. Um, Theo has got an MBA from the Gordon Institute of Business Science, and he has a doctorate from the University of Cape Town. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Theo. Theo, if you can switch on your camera. And over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> My name is uh, Theo. I'm an affiliate at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory as well, which is based in, in California. Uh, I've worked with the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy uh, Integrated Energy Efficiency Unit uh, for some years. Uh, we've supported, I've supported them on multiple projects. And as the title says, this is uh, an effort to increase the, the profile of energy efficiency demand side management, which we did um, jointly with uh, Mr. Cornelio Magusella, who's a director there, and the work was um, uh, kindly supported by USAID. So let's get straight into it. Um, next slide, right. So let's talk a little bit about demand side management. Uh, the term is used loosely, it's used interchangeably, it's misunderstood. So there's many components of demand side management. Uh, and depending on where you sit and how it impacts you, uh, it means different things. So terminology uh, matters. So if I can just go through quickly some of the, of, of the components. Um, energy conservation is, is switching a light off. No uh, uh, electricity is used when, when your lights are off. Demand response is shifting a load. So it's saying, I'm not going to use my uh, electric water heater now. I'm going to use it at a later period. So I'll still use the same amount of electricity, but possibly um, not during peak demand or possibly not when electricity is uh, most expensive. And then, of course, distributive generation is um, generating um, your own um, energy, be it through solar water heating, be it through PV or uh, a number of, of measures that can be used. And of course, we've got energy storage, um, which are batteries. But the focus of our discussion uh, is energy efficiency. So it's using the equipment you want to use at the time you are planning to use it and getting the same service, uh, but using less energy. So you're not compromised in, in, in any way. Um, there are many, um, you know, and this can take the form of either equipment, uh, more efficient equipment, or otherwise passive measures such as, um, you know, ceiling insulation or, or, or windows or that sort of, sort of thing or design. Some advantages of energy efficiency, um, it definitely helps uh, reduce energy poverty and uh, wasteful use of energy. It, uh, and, by definition, then it increases affordability uh, of energy. It reduces emissions out of all of the uh, energy sources. Uh, there are many studies to, to show this. Uh, it's got the highest job creation and across um, the spectrum. You know, they're, they're local jobs uh, and they can be uh, at all levels of, of competencies. Um, and, and importantly, they it, 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 they're national. They're not in a in a plant or in a, where a um, solar farm is being built. So these are big benefits. Um, can also delay uh, the need to build or avoid new generation and transmission build, and that's something that's 
quite important in the context of, of where we find ourselves at the moment with the, with the crisis. Uh, it can also reduce foreign exchange costs because if you're not burning as much diesel, well, then you're not buying as much diesel, right? And that's important. Uh, and then, of course, it can reduce overall and peak load uh, at the same time in the same way that demand uh, uh, response does. So it's just also important to understand uh, that there's, with, as with everything, there's some, some good uh, things and some things that need to be considered. So the first, uh, you know, some myths. So the first thing is that energy efficiency is not organic. There's a belief uh, in some quarters that uh, people are rational. Uh, people aren't necessarily rational, nor can they be expected to identify the most efficient technology. When someone who has nothing to do with, with energy or high equipment uh, operates is faced with buying new um, lamps, and we did research on this, uh, household lamps, and they get faced with a wall of different technology, different sizes, different lumens, all of these sort of things, uh, they can't be expected um, to waste too much time or become an, an expert. So the, the belief that um, Energy efficiency will grow um, over time naturally it needs to be supported and, and grows. It is the least cost uh, of all the energy sources, but it's not at no cost. So it does need financial support, um, and that should be understood. There's concerns about uh, rebound and free ride effects, so you do a uh, incentive program and people who are going to install that technology anyway uh, take advantage of the incentive. So that's a free ride and rebound. Your electricity bill can lower, so now all of a sudden you, you, you know, you're using it more freely. Those are challenges that can be dealt with. Um, the other thing is that it's many small projects. So I think that's why also it's more attractive to say, well, we're building Madupi or Kusile or there are so many. Um, uh, PV plants or, or wind, uh, wind farms, uh, because they're small, you can go, you can see them, you can touch them, you can feel them, you can quantify them, you can measure them. Very different to energy efficiency. Uh, and of course, um, it's energy efficiency savings are harder to model and also to plan for, but I'll, I'll come to that in a in, in few slides. So policy matters, um, and it matters hugely. So we've got a taxonomy here of um, how, things, how things work. So at the top, you have policy. From policy, flow regulations, then market incentives, and then information and awareness. So each of these interventions have um, uh, pros and cons. The regulations um, are typically universal. You know, the, the law applies to everyone, they're low cost, they're equitable uh, and they're permanent because once a law comes into effect, that's it. It's, but they do require oversight, uh, implementation, certainly political will for, for uh, regulations, and they take uh, some time. Market incentives can be quicker, they're more high profile, and you can target specific technologies. However, um, as Rudy pointed out, the, the, the PV uh, incentive came to an end with this new budget. So they're not sustainable. Again, as I said, you get free riders. Um, there could be corruption around that. We experienced that with the solar water heating uh, rebate program. Um, a lot of stuff was going on uh, around them. Of course, market incentives are, are very expensive uh, to provide uh, that kind of money. Uh, they also have uh, high market costs and they can create distortions. Finally, you know, that can come with risk because if businesses are building the middle, uh, business models around market incentives, that's not a good place to start. So when you withdraw it, it becomes quite difficult. Uh, information and awareness um, can result in behavioral changes that are long term. Um, you know, people have gotten into um, Cape Town at the moment and people are using less water, the, the whole thing is still in fresh in your mind and, and people are still switching off users, I, I believe. Um, but these uh, campaigns are expensive to advertise in, in the media uh, and they're difficult to measure and people can get uh, fatigued from them. Um, so for programs such as um, Power Alert, uh, it's still effective, but not as it was. So I just want to draw your attention for the period up to 2016 and post 2016. So 
When the electricity crisis first started, it was, well, energy efficiency was supported by the National Energy Efficiency Strategy. Uh, it was included comprehensively in the IRP in 2010. Possibly a, a higher target would have been great, but certainly there was a target in it. What did that result in? That resulted in um, the standards and labeling program coming in where uh, appliances are now regulated. Uh, they have to use a certain amount of electricity, otherwise they cannot enter the market. And there's also labels to inform consumers. 10400 uh, XA came in, those are the building regulations for all new homes. Mandatory audits were introduced. Regulation 773, which amongst other things requires the mandatory installation of smart meters for any home using more than a thousand kilowatt hours. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, um, regulation uh, was taken. On the, on the incentive side, we saw uh, the 12 EE incentive, municipal EE DSM. The DSM levy uh, was introduced. So everyone was paying two or three cents per kilowatt hour, which funded the ESCOM IDM program. And that was a multi-billion um, rand program that delivered over 4.2 gigawatts um, uh, during its period and, and, and made a huge difference. Uh, there's also incentives for large users for demand response. The, uh, the Manufacturing Competitive Enhancements Program, from what I understand, was uh, oversubscribed within days of being introduced. Uh, and that was to help um, businesses that was introduced by the DTRC uh, to help uh, companies become more competitive. And there was concessional financing. There were at least uh, two large um, energy efficiency funds where people could go and get concessional funding. Uh, there was power alert on information awareness. Uh, there was a lot of uh, media advertising, both on TV, magazines, newspapers, that sort of thing. And even business came together in energy efficiency, of course. If we now move to the post-2015 um, period up until today, uh, you can see the policy signals uh, were removed. So the national energy efficiency strategy was removed, but was never um, ratified by cabinet. So it's there, but it's not there. Uh, EDSM was excluded completely in the 2019 and 2023 IRPs. And what's, what's happened as a result of these policy signals being removed? To introduce, to strengthen the regulations and introduce new uh, regulations for equipment um, uh, has stalled. And we actually have to use the MECOM mechanism um, to get the new regulations for uh, general service lamps into, um, to be signed off. Um, so uh, that's, that's sort of kind of uh, what happened. But, uh, uh, because of the policy signal being lost. The 10400 XA2 has been published uh, to deal with some of the um, you know, TV problems with the first one. The um, Reg 773, there's been limited implementation of that. Uh, on, a, on a more positive note, the uh, regulations for the energy performance certificates were promulgated by the Minister of Energy, which requires all buildings uh, over a certain size to display an, uh, a certificate saying how efficient or not efficient they are without needing to take any action. But there's been huge resistance uh, from the private sector such that the minister had to extend the period by another year. So again, um, you know, I feel the, the private sector hasn't helped there. The, on market incentives, I understand the 12-hour incentive uh, will expire in 2025. Uh, there's talk that um, the EDSM fund um, may be reduced. Um, not confirmed, but there is talk. The DSM, the IDM program was stopped. Uh, the uh, the demand response program is ongoing. Um, the MCP was not extended and concessional finance, uh, uh, financing um, is not available uh, as far as I know. So you can see how important uh, the policy signals um, become uh, and why the, the EDSM has to be included. So wouldn't it be great if we could have one of these, I think they were all over the place during the IDM program, wouldn't it be great if we could have one of these presentations saying how big 
our contribution the uh, energy efficiency is making um, to the, the power crisis in, in, in South Africa. So what are the um, enabling conditions uh, for EDSM? So it has to be recognized at the highest political level as a valuable and long-term energy resource. There should be mandatory energy saving goals. We need regular studies, and my colleagues from this university will present a, such a study, which helps um, strengthen the case for um, en energy efficiency. But without these studies, we, we can't quantify it. So um, it also goes into a vicious circle. If you don't have policy, you don't have studies, and then you don't have studies, you can't make policy. Uh, I, I believe the EDSM should be a fixed resource uh, of the IRP in the same way that we have uh, solar, wind, uh, green hydrogen, um, nuclear, all of the energy sources. There has to be a mechanism for cost recovery. No one can introduce uh, or undertake a ESM program without um, being able to be paid to do it other than the funding. So this can be typically funded through a DSM levy, it can be through ESCOM or it can be at the distributor level, it doesn't really matter, there's many mechanisms, uh, but it also can come from other sources such as the carbon tax or a general tax to fund um, that sort of thing. So we saw yesterday the Minister of Finance made two billion available um, for smart meters. So uh, that's, that's an example of that. So if we look at the um, utility uh, business model, uh, you know, unless they're in the situation where ESCOM ends at the moment, they've got no incentive um, to do it. So you have to overcome the barriers of the additional costs that a DSM program will introduce. You have to um, um, overcome that the sales will be reduced uh, and how they deal with that, how they internalize that. Um, and also they've built some assets. They want to work those assets to maximize their returns. So how do you tell a utility to stop um, you know, producing uh, electricity, whether it's from coal, nuclear, or, or whatever the source may be. So some of the options include decoup uh, revenue decoupling, um, or alternatively, there are performance incentives. And um, at, uh, I'll go into where more information about those can be found at the end of the presentation. So just to um, conclude some thoughts. So we've seen households uh, are changing significantly. People, uh, middle and in high income homes uh, are becoming consumers. Uh, they're generating, some are net exporters. It's, it's bringing the whole model that we've had around distribution, electricity distribution uh, under threat. It served us well for a hundred years. It served us so well that it was written into the constitution. But what's going to happen when the cross subsidization can no longer occur from the surpluses of electricity sales, when uh, people are exiting um, the market uh, because they can afford to, and lower income uh, consumers who cannot afford to are left carrying the bill, those tariffs are So inequality increases. We've got to recognize that a kilowatt hour is not a kilowatt hour. So if there's an excess of supply through rooftop PV, uh, during the day, that is less valuable than one that is being sold uh, at peak demand, and ESCOM knows that better than anyone when they're burning uh, the gas um, at eight grand a kilowatt hour. So EDSM can introduce demand flexibility to to address some of these or reduce some of these uh, system constraints. And then just a thought around because the IRP is so topical at the moment. Uh, a power development plan is what vertically integrated utilities used to do um, in days gone by, where they were the only game in town and they controlled everything. It was simple, they charged you one uh, rate and everything was paid for from that tariff that they charged. But that is no longer the case. Uh, you've got different distributors, you've got um, consumers who can produce, you've got other people generating, it's, it's not, um, fit for purpose anymore. And of course, uh, although it was easy to understand and, and, and sought least cost, it was only least cost uh, to the utility. An integrated resource plan, on the other hand, which was introduced um, you know, sort of from the 80s and 90s, is a much, it seeks to address all of these things that I've raised. So it starts off with the public participation. It lists 
the objectives that you want to achieve, the national objectives. So for uh, South Africa, it's the um, uh, it's a triple challenge: um, job, um, unemployment, inequality, our environmental uh, issues that we have in people living around um, coal power stations, and as well as our international obligations. It then goes into demand forecasting um, with supply options as well as demand side options. So how can demand side be used to delay the capital spend on uh, generation, transmission, and distribution infrastructure? Then multiple IRPs are developed, and then the preferred option is um, selected through a transparent process. So it's hugely important that there's a better appreciation uh, of what uh, the IRP is meant to achieve and the role of EEDSM within this, uh, both from the public and private sector. And then finally, my last point, Chris, is that without policy signals, uh, people don't respond. So it's, the regulator won't grant uh, the DSM levy if there's no film policy signal, as I've explained. Banks won't make financing available, um, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and look forward to the q &A. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Theo, uh, for those uh, high-level insights onto, uh, on, on the subject of demand management and, and energy efficiency, really bringing his knowledge and understanding uh, of the subject matter in, in a way to us that I think uh, even I could understand. Uh, and I really appreciate that. And you've highlighted some important uh, policy signals that were there that are missing or that uh, were not there that should be there. Uh, you know, the question of the IRP and the fact that there's no mention of, uh, you know, energy efficiency and demand side, demand management in, in uh, meeting the needs of, of South Africa. And for me, that's a very big uh, omission. And uh, thanks for drawing our attention to that, Theo. Uh, so uh, it's now on to the uh, last uh, presentation. Uh, and this is a joint presentation um, given by uh, Dr. Jesse Yen, as well as uh, Professor Ken Nixon. Uh, both of them are from the uh, University of Witwatersrand School of Electrical and Electronic uh, uh, School of Electrical and Information Engineering, uh, where Jesse is a researcher, a teacher, and invo involved also with various outreach programs specializing in the modeling of energy systems for various contexts, including demand side management and grid interactive bu buildings with a focus on water heating. So we're going to hear uh, about some of their research. And at a particular point in the presentation, she's going to hand over to her colleague, Dr. Ken Nixon, Professor Ken Nixon as well, uh, who's an associate professor at the School of Electrical Information Engineering at WITS. Uh, he's a, a you know, long-standing fellow of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, and, and he, he's been at WITS doing research and teaching for, for many years. So it's going to be really interesting to hear about your research project um, uh, Jesse and Ken. So I'm going to hand over uh, firstly to Jesse, uh, who's going to give the first part of the presentation. And at a particular point, she'll hand over to Ken. Over to you, Jesse. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, as Theo mentioned, uh, there, there are some big issues that we need to try and resolve using um, demand side management um, techniques. And so this is a water heating study that um, we have um, completed in response to um, the electricity minister's um, statement on trying to reduce load shedding with geysers. So, so this is the response to it. And we have um, shared this presentation with NECOM 5, Workshop 5, in the demand side management. So I'd like to just take a moment to thank um, the funders of this project. Um, which is USAID and the Department of US um, Department of Energy. Um, I'd like to just take a moment to recognize the, the team members and those who have been involved in this project and who really have made it possible. I won't take too much time on this, but um, really this project is um, not possible without them. Uh, we will be specifically talking about the simulation and the results from that simulation. So um, we'll, we'll head straight into it. So in talking about uh, water heating impact of um, on, on the power grid, uh, we estimate 
as much as 20% um, towards the, the South African national peak. Now, this might be a slightly higher um, estimate, but it, it could be that high. Um, and it, it, is, it is quite a staggering amount. Um, just to draw your attention to a household and, and, and where that load can come from. So we've got a house with occupants in that house um, with a geyser that's attached to it. And we were considering geysers that had um, a grid connection and a water connection. So um, part of our segmentation study looked into the number of geysers that um, exists on the on the grid, but also um, looking at how many um, are connected. Um, we've also got um, general household um, loads. Now, these aren't part of the study, but just a recognition that they are part of a household. And um, due to load shedding, we have also seen a lot more um, PV panels and um, and, and on-site generation occurring. So uh, we, we have that consideration. Uh, just to talk about the opportunity when it comes to um, water heating, for normal operation, uh, we're just looking at a geyser that has a thermostat on it. We've got six people um, in this in this particular household, and we've taken out all the rest. So we've taken out the um, plugs and, and the PV panels. And what we would typically see in the household um, for, for that geyser is, um, this is from midnight to midnight in, in time. Um, as people are drawing, so th these little black spikes here are um, draw events that occur on, um, on that geyser. And we see a dip in um, temperatures. So we've identified three temperatures here. The um, top, this is the thermostat level, and this is the very bottom of the geyser. So we could see that as people are drawing water, the temperatures are changing in the tank, and ultimately that's setting off the element to turn on and off, depending on where that thermostat um, is sitting. The opportunity that comes with um, a geyser is that um, when we use hot water, we don't actually need to draw directly from the grid at that time because of the storage capabilities of the thermo, um, of, of the geyser. So we could ultimately put a switch in place. And some of you may know um, a switch that you put in the DB board or ripple control by the municipalities or some third party um, controller that um, connects to an app or something of that nature. So if we consider the same um, set of um, draws, and, and, and if we were to use that switch um, to switch off geysers during um, ESCOM peak times, so that is all the gray areas over here. Um, so that's from six to nine and from five to nine in the evening. We still see the same draws that occur, but rather um, than drawing from the grid as it happens, um, our switch is inhibiting that. And so therefore we, we only start drawing after that period. And you can see that the temperatures are massively reduced um, from there. And, and that could ultimately um, affect your quality of service. So just to talk a little bit about the methodology that we used, we've used each of those geysers in um, 3,000 samples of them. We've got a whole bunch of inputs. So I'm not going to go into it. And you can um, attend our talk on Monday to, uh, to, to, to see the discussion on that. But I'd rather just um, like to focus on the fact that it was a Monte Carlo, it was um, computationally heavy, and ultimately we've produced low profiles for summer and winter um, for, um, for the national um, impact. So just to give you an idea of what our baseline looks like, uh, we've looked at 2023, so that's sort of the current year, and we've looked at a 10-year projection um, to 2033. Notably, we have um, a forecasted additional 1.2 million geysers on, um, on, on the grid, so um, between those 10 years. So at um, 2023, we have an estimate of 5.2 million, and in 2033, we have an estimate of 6.4 million. The other thing that impacts um, our low profiles here is that 
we, we are expecting a fair amount of additional solar on the system. So that's just to note. So, so uh, what we see from the extra 1.2 million geysers, particularly in the winter, is that's, that's where we see the most load given the, the lower temperatures, um, is almost um, a whole gigawatt worth of um, of generation uh, extra load on on the grid. We see that there's a much lower um, level here um, during the day, and that's that's due to um, quite a bit more solar that's on on the system. So we're going to just continue on with the winter, just because um, the the impacts are quite similar. But just to note that a simulation is as good as its inputs. So we've tried very hard to ensure that um, our inputs align to um, to what is happening on the ground, but they can always be refined. And really what we're interested in is the movement from the mean, so the movement from our baseline. Just to note that we have looked at a few interventions, so that was looking at what we think um, water heating load currently looks like and could look like without any in interventions. So we've considered a, a whole range of them, and um, this links very much to what uh, Dr. Theo was saying much earlier. Um, and we have identified three just to discuss with you today. Um, so I won't go into the details of it. You can see on the screen there. Um, so first off, we're going to talk about the reduction of um, element ratings through a regulatory mechanism. And we really said, well, what if we just reduced all the, the elements in, in, in the Giza fleet, um, just to see what that impact would look like. So what we did was we um, reduced the four kilowatts to three kilowatts, that's for 200 liter, um, a three kilowatt to two kilowatts, and that's 150 liters, and then no change to the lower um, geysers. Now, um, the, these are element sizes that already exist in, you know, in the manufacturing space. So um, really this is, Quite a simple uh, regulation to 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 implement if if we do do that, and we've made the assumption that a hundred percent of um, the geysers take on this intervention by the year twenty thirty three. What we see here is still the twenty twenty three baseline. That's the um, the light blue, and the twenty thirty three baseline, uh, which is the darker blue. And the intervention that we've um, implemented is the, now this orange curve. And you could see, particularly in, in, in the evening, you could see a slight reduction in, um, in evening peak, but now the, the peak is just a bit longer. So it, it, it takes on, um, elements need to turn on just a bit longer to recover that energy. Interestingly, what we see in the morning peak is also a reduction, but um, interestingly, it, it brings it down a lot more, and that's that's due to the solar that comes in. Um, when we look at the quality of service, so that's anything below 40 degrees, if you have a, a shower that's below 40 degrees, you, you're an unhappy person. So uh, we wanted to just see what that um, impacts on, on the ground. So 8% um, of the geysers um, experience colder showers than... Um, than the baseline. Um, just to note here that this is passive load shifting. So, you know, th there's nothing active about this um, other than it coming out of the manufacturing um, space. So um, it's a passive um, impact. Just to note the um, the difference from the, um, the, the 2033 baseline, so um, what we're seeing here on the left is um, if you've got an if we've got a negative value, it means that we are reducing the load from the baseline, and if it's positive, it means that it's increasing um, in comparison to the baseline. So um, ultimately, we could see that um, this intervention can reduce the peaks um, during ESCOM load, load shedding uh, peak times. The next intervention that we looked at, and by as you can see, we looked at many different interventions. So we've just focused on uh, three themes here for the purposes of today. The next one is a consideration around time of use tariff being a, a, a driving mechanism and uh, using timers to enforce that to a certain degree. So what does that look like? In essence, um, we consider a certain percentage of geezers uh, that have a switch on them 
that stops them from switching on during the peak time. So there's a there's a hard stop at six to nine. Um, obviously, in the fleet that we've simulated, we've only uh, selected random users. And we've looked at different scenarios, but in the first instance, with assuming that 10% of all geezers have this mechanism installed in it. Now, you know, following on from the, the curves that Jesse has shown, again, you've got what the, the baseline would be in 2033, what we predict it to be. What's interesting here is you can see, because we are now stopping the geezers from switching off, and any, in this one, only 10% of the geezers, you can see there's a significant impact in terms of the the maximum demand during the peak hours. And you can see, because we stopped them from switching on, there's what we would call a comeback load. When the geezers are then allowed to switch back on, obviously due to the set point, you're going to have um, the 10% the of those geezers that were off wanting to come on to uh, replace the energy lost. Um, and again, a similar a characteristic in the evening there, you can see the sort of comeback load there. So there's quite a significant um, reduction in terms of that peak demand. Um, so in essence, the time of use allows us to do load shifting. But the consequence, and I'll show you on the next slide, there is a delayed peak as a con uh, consequence. In the morning, given that we are predicting an increase in uh, solar PV um, penetration, uh, there's not a, as strong impact in the, in the morning. And there is a little bit of an energy saving there. More interestingly, and this one was a surprise for me, is if we look at 30%, so the difference between the, the last one and this one is we've just simulated 30% of users um, being um, affected by this. What is quite notable there is this very significant comeback load here. Um, Again, these are the users all wanting to replace that lost energy. So there's a very, very uh, significant reduction in the maximum demand, but we pay the price in terms of the comeback load. So we can go into more detail at another point about that, but this is an interesting observation. I think the long and short of it here is, you know, we need to replace the energy. We, as Jesse said in the previous slide there, she had the conservation of misery we still are trying to replace that lost energy. We're just shifting it to somewhere else. This brings to the, the next theme is around PV indirect. This is the, the, the notion of having a PV system with an inverter and the geyser electrical element is being uh, powered by the PV. We're, we're gonna have to go through these quite quickly, but one scenario is in our baseline, we assumed the PV penetration from all of the, the research that we did to be about 30%. We looked at a scenario, what would happen if it was 35%? So 35% of houses out there had PV systems in 2033. I think uh, what you can see obviously is you know, no real change in the morning and the evening, but there is this consequential change during the day. And I think we were interested in how big that change would be. Looking at that in terms of a difference plot, you can see it's there is a difference. Um, it's not insignificant, but it's also not a massive difference. This is a more extreme case. This was just looking at a scenario, hypothetical, of course, but what would happen if um, users that were uh, connected uh, to a PV indirect system, what if we stopped them from switching off pretty much the whole day except for when the sun was shining and we went for a, a very harsh, you know, nine o'clock, uh, 10 o'clock to three o'clock in the afternoon. And this is quite interesting. There's a massive impact here during the peaks, but quite obviously, as you can see, um, the quality of service is going to suffer. So in, in that scenario, 24% of users are not going to be supplying the hot water that one would expect from them. But again, this, could be viewed in terms of uh, an impact in terms of energy efficiency. So rather than using the classical electrical grid, we're now using PV as the source for driving that heating. That's what the, uh, the, the difference plot looks like there. So there, there's a significant impact in terms of the baseline with the PV indirect. So um, just some very quick uh, summary of the, the, the findings. I think looking at the, the baseline comparisons, and I think one of the challenges we had in the study was, you know, ultimately understanding what is the 
hot water load on the grid in South Africa? How many geysers do people have? I think the one thing that came out of that without any uh, controversy is the fact that looking forward 10 years is there is going to be an increase in demand for energy for that water heating. And as Jesse has said, there's a significant increase in geysers. Um, we, we anticipate and we have looked at different scenarios, but we suspect that uh, there will be PV, distributed um, PV in households that is going to reduce the daytime load, but we still have got some interesting challenges ahead there. Jesse talked about reducing the rating of the heating element. Um, this is something that could be easily rolled out as geysers are replaced, new geysers are bought. Um, this is a, quite an appealing uh, approach because it does have a, a, a peak um, demand reduction. It's a minor increase in energy counterintuitively because you're running the element a little bit longer, but this has a lot of appeal. And then two of the other interventions that we've looked at here and shared with you today is the, the idea of a time of use tariff and a, a timer, looking at different adoption rates there. Big impact on the peak times, but obviously some consequences in terms of the comeback load, as we've talked about, and actually a decrease in energy. And then the PV indirect, which is 30 to 35 um, adoption, again, massive decrease in energy but you know th this is one that one has to think about carefully and manage carefully so i think that the last thing i want to uh, share is just the thought that when it comes to electric water heating energy efficiency is only going to really take us so far um, we've gone a long way in terms of um, rollouts and theo can share at another time about um, strategies around en energy efficiency there I think in terms of hot water load, technology switches are going to be more important. So looking at PV as a supply or looking at other technologies to do water heating as opposed to using classical coal-fired electrical sources. So the next steps are really, you know, um, following up, looking at uh, specific model modeling to local areas, doing a pilot study and all that. But um, hopefully this uh, has shared a little bit of what we've been thinking about and you'll find it interesting. And um, thank you very much, Chris. I'll hand back to you there. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Ken and Jesse. Uh, and, and this has given us a quick summary, I think, uh, of a far more detailed presentation, a 90-minute presentation that Ken and Jesse are going to be doing on Monday. And I have shared with you on the chat uh, the link uh, to join the meeting on Monday, uh, as well as, in fact, the full presentation that uh, Ken and Jesse are going to present on, on Monday. So please do have a look at that. You can download the full presentation. And I know Ken and Jesse would welcome you at their uh, full presentation on, on, on Monday. So uh, thanks again uh, to the two of you for putting a bit of science into this subject uh, and for the great work that you do at, at Wits University in the Department of the School of uh, Electrical and Information Engineering. So now I'm going to ask um, uh, a long-standing friend and colleague of mine, uh, Brian Statham, uh, to uh, say a few words uh, that he has taken from these four presentations that we've heard today. Just to say uh, that Brian has got about 50 years experience in energy. He's been involved in generation, research, investment, planning, etc. for all these years. He is now a consultant uh, and uh, we look forward, uh, uh, Brian, to hearing your particular insights uh, from what you've heard today. Over to you, uh, Brian. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, also a big thank you to the presenters because they've given us some really interesting material. The first presentation from Hanno, he came up with this figure of 2.3 gigawatts that are available if we could just uh, do something about the uh, cooling systems at the so-called dry-cooled or air-cooled uh, power stations. And that came across as a really big number and a gee whiz number. And then in the last presentation, Jesse just quietly dropped into the conversation that domestic water heating could account for as much as 20% of peak demand in the winter months, which is also a G was number. That is huge. Now, what this tells me is that energy efficiency is 
something that can be applied through all sectors without anybody needing to feel, I'm so small, I can't make a difference. And this is so important that we get that message across. And Theo spoke about the need for people to be aware of the opportunities. And I know that in social circles when we meet, people talk a lot about what Eskom could be doing, what Eskom could be doing. But people don't talk about what they could be doing at home. And yet this presentation that Jesse and Ken put together shows that there's a tremendous difference that they could be making, all of us could be making if we were at home. There were some suggestions that we should be looking at changing processes and uh, Brad uh, gave us very important uh, caveats to that, saying that you really need to understand your processes. You need to understand if you're looking at using waste heat, what state is it in? Is it gas or is it liquid? What are the temperatures, the pressures, the flow rates? And are they consistent over time? And then also the very vexed question of contaminants in your energy stream. And uh, we worry about pollutants and, and the problems they cause with air pollution, but contaminants in process systems can also give us major headaches. We need to ask ourselves, why is it that energy efficiency is so little talked about in the media and the press? It's just not sexy. You don't Look out of a window and see a lovely new wind turbine coming out. You don't look out of the window and see a new plant. You don't see masses of solar panels. It's all happening behind the scenes and often very difficult, as Theo said, to measure it, often very difficult to model it. And so people tend to ignore it. And it is really disappointing that it has lost its traction in the IRP planning process. So what we, I think we really need to do is we need to make a concerted effort to change the mindsets of folks to start recognizing that energy efficiency, as Hannah said to us, is the true clean energy form immediately available to us if we can just do things more efficiently and better. And most of all, we need to talk to the financing community because the fact that they are embargoing funding, which is related to um, historic systems and systems that are linked to fossil fuels, is actually doing us a major disservice. And we need to find ways and means of moving them forward. So I think you've done a great job with this uh, webinar person bringing and highlighting a very much underrated energy supply opportunity which has tremendous potential and I'd like to thank all the presenters for making us aware of this uh, and I hand it back to you Chris saying that this has been a great webinar. Uh, thank you very much for those kind words, Brian, uh, and, and for the time that you've put in and for your uh, insights that come from a long and deep experience uh, in, in this field, this energy sector, not just electricity, but the whole field of energy uh, in South Africa. Uh, and through your work also on the World Energy Council uh, over all these years. Uh, so thanks for those insights. We really are honored by them. And it's now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Liz Hart. Uh, who is going to uh, say a few words about the Africa Energy in Daba, which I can tell you is uh, one of the uh, primary um, energy events uh, on, on the calendar. Uh, and Liz herself is uh, undoubtedly one of the uh, most well-experienced and respected uh, names in the uh, in, in the events business. Uh, the, the, the large uh, 
uh, industry events focusing on energy. And she's been in this field uh, where she launched this uh, Africa Energy in Daba in 2009. Now, the reason why I think uh, it's important for her to say a few words is that this uh, this um, uh, Africa Energy in Daba, which is coming up very shortly, and she'll tell you more about it, uh, you know, will be showcasing a lot of the technologies that we've talked about today, as well as a lot of other technologies uh, in, in the field of uh, uh, you know, maximizing our energy resources, our electricity resources, uh, improving energy efficiency, uh, recoverable energy, co-generation, um, uh, you know, all of the improving cooling systems, uh, policies. Uh, and, and so uh, it, it's, it's an important event. I don't want to steal her thunder. Uh, let her speak for herself and tell us, uh, you know, what uh, this is all about. So over to you, Liz. Uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, Chris, and I think you did a great intro for me. Thank you. I appreciate that. So just touching on Africa Energy in Daba, uh, 2024 will be our 16th edition. I'm very proud to say that Brian has been with us from day one uh, when we launched the event in 2009. So we've walked a long journey together. Uh, this year, we are in Cape Town um, at the CTICC from the 5th to the 7th of March. So uh, pretty stressful right now because we are just over a week away from Africa Energy in Daba. So our theme for 2024, we are looking at African energy transitioning from aspiration to action, looking at delivering a sustainable and prosperous future for the continent. So bearing in mind, we are talking all of Africa, um, which is very vast. So there are many different aspects, but we try and have an all-encompassing program that is collated by experts headed up by Brian as our conference chairman, um, looking at what are the most pressing issues and what is keeping energy leaders awake at night um, across the continent. Obviously, we can't be all to everybody, but we really do try and touch on the most pressing issues. And I think that's evident in the quality of our conference content, um, sharing a lot of thought leadership um, and having really good quality speakers debating and discussing the issues that um, are important today. Each year, obviously, everything changes. So just touching on who our key partners are, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, our DMRE, is our government host. Our Africa partner is the African Union Development Agency, host city, city of Cape Town, and then we have trade association partners. Some of our sponsors and partners this year, we can see, you can see we have a flurry of um, different companies that are involved with the event. Uh, ranging from renewable energy companies, government bodies, uh, foreign companies. Uh, there are many more since I've uh, did the slides, so quite a few uh, new ones that have come on board. We're also very proud to continue our partnership with the CEF group of companies as our premium partner. Um, and then uh, we have a few new developments for 2024, which um, I'll touch on. So we're launching the renewables in Daba. We're very proud of the new partnership we've established with the Global Wind Energy Council, um, Solar Power Europe, Gogla, Global Distributors Collective, the Alliance for Rural Electrification, and further supported by Get Invest. So the renewables in Daba will be a one-day conference that's been collated by these different partners and stakeholders at Africa Energy in Daba. Um, so we're very excited about this um, partnership and really talking to a very um, well-represented African contingent of, of speakers um, addressing the growth potential for renewables um, in Africa. So just touching on what's happening at Africa Energy in Daba, uh, there's a lot. We have a full week of different activities taking place. So kicking off the Monday, we have the Gas Forum, uh, which is a well-established event looking at gas. We have Tuesday is our main day where we have uh, Minister Gwede Mantashe kicking off the uh, main Energy in Daba conference, our exhibition. We host a leader dialogue for very high level uh, leaders in the energy sector hosted by McKinsey and Company. Um, the Africa Forum for Utility Regulators will once again be hosting their conference alongside the event and our welcome cocktail. Um, just running through the top key issues that I'd like to highlight, uh, South, the South African government um, under the auspices of the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy will be hosting a spotlight on um, energy investment opportunities in South Africa. So DMRE are hosting this event on the Wednesday. 
um, taking place the Wednesday afternoon as part of the Indaba conference. And we are also hosting a power pool session hosted by the African Union Development Agency. So these are also two new developments that have just come through, um, and we're delighted to have DMRE's full support with the South African Energy Investment Forum um, that will be um, running uh, as a side event of the main event. We have a number of CEO roundtables being hosted by uh, Boston Consulting Group together with Carney and a gala dinner. Some of the key features for the Thursday include a Women in Energy Breakfast, our traditional IPP and PPA conference with keynote speaker, Mr. Bernard Mahora from the IPP office, an electric vehicle forum, a hydrogen forum that we're hosting in partnership with the Department of Science and Innovation, Sinedi and JICA together with McKinsey and company, a nuclear forum back on the agenda for this year. Uh, big support from DMRE, so we're very excited about this. Also, with all the big international vendors participating, Kipco, Rasatom, um, Sanerdi from China. Uh, so all the big vendors are there and a very detailed program that we are hosting very closely aligned with DMRE. So a lot happening at Africa Energy in Darba this year, a lot of different activities. People can register for whichever sessions are of interest to them. Um, so you don't have to register for the whole week. You could come, for example, just the IPP conference, depending on which elements are of interest uh, to you. Just some images from last year's um, and previous year's events, just to give you an idea of what the event looks like, um, our exhibition that's taking place. Supporting business at Africa Energy in Darby is a key focus for us. We host a B2B Connect program where people can see who is attending and request meetings with them. So very important that companies attending Energy in Darby do business. So we have a program that facilitates that opportunity at the event for all exhibitors, sponsors and delegates. So we encourage you to consider registering. How do you register? You can go to africaenergyindaba.com and all the information's there. Alternatively, you can email me. Um, we'll drop my email, my contact details on the post uh, event report once Chris shares this with you. Back to you, Chris. I hope that's, uh, I haven't taken up too much of your time. Wow, Liz, that looks like one hell of an event. And uh, congratulations uh, to you and uh, also to Brian. For putting it together it's really comprehensive it's controversial it's just what we need uh, to get people together and talking and engaging and showing uh, products and services so thanks for those uh, words ladies and gentlemen it's been a wonderful set of presentations and we're now going to go into the q a session and i must say thank you very very much to our presenters who have done a wonderful job helping me with this q a session because Sometimes we get, you know, 40, 50, 60 questions, uh, and we've had a lot today as well. Uh, and I ask the presenters to assist in um, replying to as many as possible of the questions on the uh, text Q&A facility. And I see that there are only three questions that remain unanswered. But I, I've been kind of watching the questions, and I've seen uh, that a number of them have been answered. And I, I would like to, uh, you know, home in on a few of these. So... I would like to, first of all, ask all our uh, presenters to switch on their cameras and their microphones so that we can see you on the panel discussion. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's good to see that you're all still there. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I want to just kick off by posing a few questions on, on my own that I've sort of gathered also from um you know uh, uh, you know from the, the the presentation and i'm going to address my question to one or other presenter and, and ask you to to come in here so the the first one is to you brad um you talked about uh, waste heat recovery and um you talked about it's important to know you know the uh, times when the waste heat uh, will be generated and when it will be available and uh, whether it's intermittent or not uh, and I'd like to ask you, are there any opportunities for waste heat recovery from the open cycle gas turbines, ESKIMs, as well as the IPP open cycle gas turbines, you know, the Kharikwa and the uh, Ankerlach and the, the IPP OCGTs? Um, now, look, we know that those uh, OCGTs were only supposed to be running, you know, at a very low load factor, uh, but they've been running at quite a high load factor. 
Are there any opportunities for waste heat recovery from these OCGTs, or is the intermittency of this uh, heat stream such that it makes this uh, not a, not viable? Yeah, <clears throat> the intermittency doesn't make it. Yeah, makes it not as viable as if we had the continuous and shut down for a month or so. But yeah, it is. Yeah, Thank you. a compound cycle would be ideal, but that intermittency because yeah. you get it up to pressure and steam, and then. If you're shutting down the next beat or so, then you're not going to have as much your know, energy recovery from your steam steam cycle. Yeah, that, that that's what I kind of thought, uh, Brad. Uh, you know, people have mentioned to me, why aren't we doing this? And I think you you've given the answer that uh, the intermittency and unpredictability of how these things are going to operate and when uh, makes this not a exactly viable uh, 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 you know application. Look. I, I did see a question from uh, Mr. Kurt Wellman, which uh, pricked my interest. Uh, it may have been answered uh, already, but I'd like to put this to Anna Reuter. Um, and, and that is, is this um, the waste heat or the, 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 shall I say, the reduced output from the dry air-cooled power stations, is it a result of the, the, the uh, temperature um, you know, uh, of, of, of the ambient, or is it to do with the, the fact that these uh, uh, fans that are operating um, may be operating at very light load, but they still have a parasitic load and, and that uh, is causing a reduction in the overall output of the power station. And, and what would be the role of uh, variable speed drives on these fans? Are they fixed speed fans or could they be uh, changed to variable speed to uh, further increase the efficiency uh, of the system uh, at light loads when the fans might not really be needed? Uh, if you could give us uh, some thoughts on that. Um, uh, yes. Johanna. Chris, Chris, can you hear me? Somehow, it, can you hear me? Yes. It yes, we can like hear you well. On, thank on you. My, on my view, I'm muted and I can't see myself. So can you see me as well? All right. We can Thanks see for the you. Question. We can hear you. Thank you. Yes. So, so, um, Regarding the um, the improvement, it's mainly thermodynamically uh, and a thermodynamic improvement. Um, so, some uh, one of the um, participants or one of the attendees here, delegates, um, pointed out that um, I said uh, there was a mistake in one of the slides. It's one degree degree at uh, one degree Celsius change in s exhaust steam temperature gives you a an improvement of 0.4 percent to one percent. Now that one percent is at high, very high temperatures. Typically, the the 0.4 percent is is more around the design conditions, right? So, so um, if if one now looks at the parasitic load on 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 Matimba, it's it's just I'm trying to stick to one, uh, one uh, case, um, is in the order of uh, 1.7 percent of the of the output. Um, so and and you see that that I'm um I'm gaining uh eight nine eight, oh, seven eight percent. On, on the thermodynamics then. So so yes, a part of it is is a, a parasitic load. Uh, the rest is is um uh, due to the the, the change in, in temperature. Um then regarding the variable speed drives, um look it's an economic question. So usually when 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 plants are operated in very in, in low part loads or um you know, in part load uh, operation, uh, it makes sense to to then save on fan power. But these these plants are typically operated at maximum uh, load, and and they need to the efficiency needs to be optimized. So there there are many fans, as you saw, uh, forty eight on Matimba and sixty four, I think, on Madupi. So so there's redundancy. So when they do um, decide to not operate these fans, they switch them off. Um, so even even on small plants that are operating in 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 in, in cycle cycle operation. Um, so it's often not even uh, um, doesn't make sense to to use VSDs, um, but yeah, that's my answer. So I, I think in this for this type of plant for these large ESCOM plants, I, I don't think it makes economic sense. Otherwise, they would have done it by now as well. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, while, while you're on there, um, yes. uh, Hanno, if you could just answer this, I know it has been answered on on on, yeah. on the uh, chat, but I think it's a point that needs to be yes. made made uh, strongly. The question came from Andili, and I hope I'm pronouncing your surname properly. Mbinjewa uh, asked the question, is it correct 
and what it would be the impact of wet cooling on carbon dioxide emissions. In other words, it does a wet cooled power station have any advantage or disadvantage over dry cooled power stations in terms of, of carbon dioxide emissions? Yes, thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, yes, I think uh, I think we've tried to uh, touch on that a few times uh, in my presentation, and I think uh, in the in the in the whole uh, title of this of this uh, webinar. Um, so so um, what what we are saying is that, um, and we took Majuba to be a, our case study for for that. So. We have identical boilers, um, virtually identical steam turbines. So, so we're assuming that the same amount of coal is, is combusted. In other words, the same uh, um, CO2 emissions are applicable to both, both the wet and dry cool plant. However, the wet cool plant uh, produces more power. Um, so to say that difference effectively is, is CO2 free. Thank you. Thanks for that. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I hope it did to me. Uh, thanks uh, for that, Hannah. Theo, I, I want to address this question to you. I mean, you, you pointed out uh, that in the current IRP, which is out for public comment right now, there is no mention of the contribution that um, energy efficiency and demand management uh, can and will and should make uh, to meeting demand in South Africa uh, and to to reducing load shedding, and we've seen in the in the in the base case uh, of, of Horizon One, which is in the period from 2024 to 2030, they are still predicting significant load shedding up to 2028 in in the base scenario uh, that has been. Why why do you think? There is no recognition, and, and 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 Brian touched on this point as well. Why is there no recognition to the role of demand management and energy efficiency when we know that Workstream 5 of NECOM, which you're involved in, uh, which Rudy is involved in, uh, you know, as the head of NECOM, uh, why is there no, is the DMRE ignoring this as, as, as one of the levers to meeting uh, demand in South Africa. Thank you, thank you for the question. I think there was an intention to include demand side management in the IRP and then ultimately it wasn't included. The explanation that I received is that it's sort of incorporated in the demand curve. So if you go and read the UCT demand curves, they do, make some consideration or account for some DSM in terms of the existing programs. But that's wholly insufficient uh, for uh, many reasons. Um, yes, it may more accurately um, represent the demand curves up to, up to 2030, not beyond, but it doesn't consider any improvements or any additional measures. And then certainly doesn't ramp it up by not explicitly incorporating it as a uh, a power source with a target. So I think it became, as I said, too bitty, uh, too difficult uh, to model, and it was uh, it, it wasn't incorporated. But that's my uh, view. I can't say for certain. Thank you. Thanks, Theo. And a question now to uh, Ken and Jesse, uh, if I may. Uh, I'm not sure which of you is the best to handle this, but uh, you're welcome to both make a contribution uh, to this. Now, we, I mean, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, you know, you know, the 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 fact that these demand uh, uh, demand uh, management initiatives uh, that you've talked about, you know, can make a difference to peak demand uh, by load shifting, etc. Uh, and and that is significant. You've pointed out exactly, you know, by the year twenty thirty three, you know, what the potential contribution is, but. I know this is going to be a hard one to, to give a straight answer to, but it would be nice just to get a feeling. And that is this, what is the cost per kilowatt hour or per kilowatt demand, or however you want to put this, uh, of such a program, let's say a, a, a electric geyser uh, program, which could uh, involve uh, replacing of you know, the geezer elements over a period of time, putting in time control switches and this kind of thing, time of use tariffs. But what do you estimate roughly is the 
cost per kilowatt hour reduced or the cost per kilowatt demand reduced to give an idea of the relative costs of your initiative uh, if it was implemented versus what it would cost to build you know new power plants or whether they're renewable or wind or solar because we we kind of know you know the cost per kilowatt installed of a coal plant of a nuclear plant of a wind plant etc these are figures that are you know available from Lazard and others uh, but what is the cost of this initiative of yours if it were implemented Chris, I'm going to I'm going to answer very quickly, and I'll see Theo will also answer here. And I think it is the million dollar question. I, I think in the most immediate term, we were just trying to understand what the effect would be, and we've put a lot of effort in trying to see what is the effect, and then the the next step to thoroughly understand the cost. You've got to do that cost benefit type thing. But I know Theo will have some stuff to to comment here as well. But Long and short, that is the million dollar question. Um, and um, we would like to have a, a solid answer, but I think uh, we're still moving towards that. Theo, over to you. Thank you. Um, Jesse, um, anything to add before we oh, okay? Yeah, so the idea, and I've seen a lot of questions being asked, and, uh, and I think they were answered as we were going along. There, were, uh, there was a whole suite of interventions that were available. We pick the ones from the regulatory side to start off with because those come at the lowest cost and the lowest effort and they're equitable. So that was the, the rationale be behind it. So we completely understand that a technology switch to heat pump or solar water heating um, will make sense, but how do you get people to migrate? You've got to go through an incentive. You can't you can't force people to spend five times more to, to heat water when, when the geyser bursts or, or something like that. But to give you a sense of an answer, in 2015, when we did a similar study um, on, on standing losses, we increased the insulation such that this maximum standing loss for 24 hours went from 2.54 kilowatt hours over a 24 hour period to under 1.4. So if you buy these now, it's at a class B, not a class E. That saving uh, is in excess up to 2030 of three terawatt hours. That is equivalent to one uh, 800 megawatt coal power plant running continuously for one year. So, you know, uh, I don't know what that would cost, but it would cost a lot for to, to fire up an 800. So that was just by increasing the insulation around solar, um, around electric geysers to um, make them more efficient. So these are the kind of efforts. What we've also seen in our research is some municipalities who are doing ripple uh, relay get charged a megaflex rate uh, during peak periods, and they um, switch on their ripple relay during peak periods. It doesn't affect consumers. They don't know that the ripple relays are even on. And that reduces their municipal bill by up to 20 million rand for some metros because when they're selling electricity during peak periods in winter, they're selling at a loss uh, because it's a fixed tariff to the consumer, but to ESCOM, it's a, it's a time of use or megaflex tariff. So these are the kind of benefits and the knock-on effects that, that you have without losing any service. Thanks, Theo. Uh, Jesse, do you want to add anything uh, to this? Um, uh, over to you. Um, nothing too much, really, um, other than just the fact that we we were really looking at um, putting together a, a modeling platform. So um, the assumptions and the interventions that we could um, model um, are are pretty extensive. Um, so we we are looking at um, extending the model just to see if um, other technology changes. Um, could have similar impacts or greater impacts. So, so the, the platform is there. Um, so the extension of this work would, would be very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, it really is going to be interesting. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, Science-based work, looking at these different initiatives. And I, I take um, Ken's point that there's still uh, work to be done uh, in looking at the cost side of things after having looked at the uh, the impact uh, that could be achieved. But I want to just now put the same question, and this will be the last question before we go to the hands up questions, uh, which I want to take a few questions from people who put their hands up, and we'll deal with those orally. Uh, but uh, the last question to you, Hanno, is exactly the same. 
What, what do you estimate? I mean, we heard that you know all of these things come at some cost. We know that uh, hopefully it's the least cost. But what do you estimate the cost per kilowatt that you could deliver through this hybrid cooling system of yours? Um, you know, what, what would be the cost per kilowatt installed? Uh, I mean, I know this is not possible to get accurate, and I'm not asking you for a quotation. Uh, I'm just asking you to give us a, a rough feeling so we can get the sense of, of what is the cost compared to the cost of a new build. Yeah, look, um, I think in terms of um, what I uh, what I put in my presentation, um, you'll see that um, there's a capex that I've given, and then there's a, re a, re a return of investment. So, a uh, period. So. Uh, typically, the capex is quite low. The opex is is not negligible. We are using water. It's 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 uh, it, we are consuming water to to to. It's not magic the way we we are achieving this efficiency improvement. Um. So so between um on a number of of projects that I've been working on, the paybacks were in the order of two to five years. Um. Which is which is very low for any power power plant technology. Uh. That from what I know. Yeah, I mean, we to use, usually talk about 20 years, 10, 10 to 20 years on, on payback on power plant uh, equipment. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think, yeah, it really does. And, and you've, you've pointed out to me something that I should have uh, realized. And that, that that's not just the CapEx, uh, you know, rands per kilowatt installed that we should be looking at. We should be looking at the levelized cost of electricity over the lifetime of this uh, exactly. initiative. Uh, yeah. That takes into account both the capex and the opex, and that uh, you know all of these issues over the, the lifetime uh, and the payback period. I, I think so. You have in fact given and answered that question uh, in your presentation, and all these presentations are going to be shared with everybody uh, that uh, registered to attend today. So uh, there's plenty of uh, stuff that we can study. Uh, Jesse and Ken's study, uh, you know, will be available. Uh, as is the presentations from Mano and, 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 and Theo uh, and, and Brad. So uh, I think that brings to an end the, 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 the Q&A via the text question. But I'm going to ask if there's anybody who would like to ask a verbal question to please put your hand up. Uh, if you know how to do that, uh, there's a thing called raise hand. I will see that your hand is up <laughs> and I will give the mic to you to ask your question. But I want to just ask, please, gentlemen and ladies, no grandstanding. Please ask your question. Just one question, you know, because there's a lot of questions out there. Uh, and, and, and if you can keep it short and sharp, and I'm going to ask the presenters, uh, I will direct the question to one of the presenters. And I can, if I can ask them to keep their answers short and sharp so we can deal with as many questions as we can uh, from the hands uppers. So the first hands upper is um, uh, Paseka Mabina. Uh, I'm going to allow you to talk now, and you can switch your microphone on, Paseka, and ask your question verbally. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have a question for Jesse and Ken. I typed it, but I don't know if you guys saw it. Just wanted to see um, how did you guys go about modeling of your um, water heating system? Um, so... Basically, I saw, because I was reading your presentation and it is quite detailed and I really love the work that you guys are doing. And one thing that I wanted to understand it is that what are the attributes that went to modeling water heating systems? And perhaps maybe we can even catch up later on just to, to, to share the work that we, we, we're trying to do and also see how the synergies and outline that. So, because uh, yeah, the, the result could possibly would be different compared to what we are using and how our approach where and based on your approach. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Paseka. Thank you, and if I can hand that over to Jesse to start off with, thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so I did respond to that um, question, Paseka, um, but I'll, I'll respond verbally as well. Um, the, the model was, um, experimentally validated so so actually this is the model that was um, developed in my PhD um, so it's been experimentally validated however the national profile is a lot harder to um, to validate because now you're aggregating um, all of these low profiles um, we we attempted to 
compare against ADMDs for ripple relays in previous studies. And so we're, we're quite comfortable with that, but we, we understand that there are some challenges even with, with those studies. So um, we're very happy to have a further conversation to see where alignment can happen. Thank you. Ken, is there anything you want to come in here on? I'm just going to add just a comment that came out of a previous discussion around this is that uh, we need to revive the communities where we discuss these things. And I think that is part of what we want to do. We want to engage further. We've got colleagues at other institutions. I think there's a great need for all of us to come together and share ideas and not necessarily retread ground and all that. So I think very exciting to hear, Paseka, that you, you're clearly doing something in a similar space. Let's do more of it. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ken. And I see the next uh, person with the hands up is David uh, Serfentain. Known David for many years. Uh, he was with Northwest University. And it's a pleasure to have you here, David. I'm going to allow you to talk. Uh, please switch your microphone on now. Yes, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm responding to the um, the, the uh, presentations of uh, Ken and uh, Jesse, so so the key issue here is, uh, you know, they didn't expressly um, uh, the solar, but the, the point of solar is that you can make solar power very cheaply, but it's very expensive to store. So if you can use this water, hot, hot water issue as a storage means, then you can make, you know, a solar power work very easily and cheaply. And the point is that uh, a water heater tank is much cheaper to store the same amount of heat than a battery. So my point is just, uh, I've studied this for myself and so on, and I'm looking at the economics of, of energy and so on, is that uh, the, the thing, if you implement the, th thing, the two things that, that they spoke about, switching off the geyser for a time and also limiting the, the element size, the thing that you should do is double the geyser uh, capacity. So you should put put two geysers in, uh, <laughs> and then uh, you know, and and then you don't have that thing of then you can really limit the uh, because when you did what you did aggressively, you ended up with cold water and unhappy people. But if you have two geysers, you can do all you did. You can do it much more aggressively than you've done it, and you won't end up with uh, uh, you know people with cold water and a new geyser cost five thousand rands and a new battery cost twenty five thousand rands. So. Uh, you know, that's that's the point that I see there. And, and then you also don't have that uh, switch on uh, load backup because then you can also uh, limit, you can limit the element sizes even more. Reducing the element size from three kilowatts to two kilowatts means that the thing is still going to give power in that same peak. But if you can reduce it from, uh, you know, from four to two, then you spread it out till after the peak and, and, and also the comeback power is a lot lower. So the key of my message is, or my question is, uh, do you think the viable solution is to just double the, the geysers and then do everything that you said and do it much more aggressively than you said? Yeah, thank you, David. I, I really do love this thinking out of the box and not taking anything for granted about the way we used to do it should be the way we should do it for future. And I'm sure the Giza manufacturers will love you for this idea. And, and it will be, it's a hell of an interesting solution because it, 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 it may be the least cost way of storing energy. I see Jessie's hand is, is up and I want to hear what she has to say about this. Thank you, Jessie. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, David, for your question and your comment. I think that, um, you know, in, in, our, in our team, we, we have really considered all the options except for that one, actually. But um, the one way that we are looking at um, modeling in a future work is is to um, consider the time of use timers and include um, an increase in thermostat temperature settings. So, so actually having variable thermostats um, pretty much achieves a similar thing to what you were stating there. Um, and obviously, then you just still have only one geyser that you're working with. So you could sort of overheat your geysers, um, even up to perhaps even 90 degrees. Um, but but then obviously the, the um, safety at, at the tap would be we need to be considered. So um, there are definitely a lot of variables that we could play with. And um, we certainly haven't been able to model all of them, but we are very aware of um, all the permutations that could um, be used. Thank you.
Uh, if I Thank you. Ken, and Ken, do you want to come in there at all? Yeah. Ken? No, he's okay. Theo, do you want to come in at all? Okay, fine. We're going to move on to the next question. Now, I'm going to ask the, the hands up is now. We're nearly at the end. Be quick, please. I must just say, we're going to call this to an end at 2.30 uh, at officially, but unofficially, we're going to carry on. Uh, if you guys can stay on, if you can't, we understand if you have to shoot off. Uh, but while we've got the audience, while we've got you online, let's try and deal with some of these questions, but let's be quick about it. Uh, Jacques Malan, I'm allowing you to talk. Please ask your single question quickly. Uh, hi, Chris. Um, I, did, I sent some questions to Brad in the background about ORC, so he can answer those. But my question is for, for Jesse and Ken. Um, the, I, I know of a few of these um, consumer devices that's been uh, out there um, that ca they can optimize geezers and stuff like that. Uh, I assume that the that the model that you guys created can, you know, you've got the done the baseline work. So whatever these devices can do, you can model different devices and, and the, possibly the effects that these devices can have. Uh, you know, maybe you can just comment on that. Ken, do you want to take that? Jesse you had a good turn just now, and uh, good to have your input as well. Jesse could also cover that, but uh, I can talk to it. Yeah, absolutely, as you say, um, and th thanks for the question, uh, Jacques. It is, you know, we've built a platform and a model where we can do this stuff. It's just understanding what the parameters are behind those solutions so that we can feed it into the model, see what happens. But there are some interesting things there. And everyone nowadays gets excited about AI and machine learning and all that. You know, are there things that we can do to match patterns and, you know, based on a consumer profile? So this is exciting stuff. It's stuff that we want to certainly be pursuing further. But again, as we've done with everything else, we really want to, as best as we can, understand all the parameters that are affecting it so that we can be as close as we can to what's happening. So thank you. Great point. Thanks, Ken. Look, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to officially close this webinar now. If you have to leave, you have to leave. We understand even the presenters. Uh, but there are still a few hands uppers out there, uh, which we'll try and get through. Again, I just want to ask the hands uppers to please be short and sweet with your question. Not a long uh, question, not multiple questions. I see Theo's hand is up. Uh, Theo, do you want to quickly come in here? Yeah, just, just to, to make the point that there, there are millions of, of variations. We mustn't forget who our client is. It's the BMRE who are looking to implement policy for everyone. Not, um, you know, it's a great idea to put two geezers, but that's not practical at a, at a national rollout or to fund um, uh, bots or artificial intelligence to control the geezer. So we're trying to look at what can be done in an equitable way uh, through regulation that's practical. Thank you. Yeah, good point. Thank you very much for that, Thea. Yeah. Uh, okay, I see here, Michelle Riverola, your hand is up. Please keep it short and, and also ask the presenters to keep the answer as short as possible. If you can switch your uh, okay. mic on, yeah. Michelle, thank you. Yeah, just one point for Hanno. Um, ESCOM should actually start considering that there are motors that are called premium efficiency motors available on the market because at the moment they're replacing standard efficiency motors with standard efficiency motors um premium efficiency you can pay back in a year just because of the motor build uh, but i just have a question for jesse uh hot water a geezer is probably a v one of the most inefficient pieces of equipment you have hot water above the thermostat you have water that is sort of warmish between the thermostat and the heating element and then below the heating element you have cold water so <laughs> shouldn't really the solution, long-term solution, be taking the element out of the geyser, putting it in a very small uh, system where you can actually produce water at the temperature at which you want to use it. And it doesn't matter because if you need five liters of hot water, you only need five liters of hot water. You don't need 200 liters of hot water. Uh, at the moment, the way a geyser works is like people who fill a kettle with cold water, boil the whole kettle, and then use only what they need for a cup. Good point, Michelle. I'll throw that at Jesse. <laughs> How are you going to change the world, Jesse? <laughs> well, um, instantaneous water heating does exist in other countries, um, so so it's it's not a new idea. Um, I, I think 
instantaneous heating, um, at least from a loading perspective, electrical load is, is fairly high. So it is bigger than three kilowatts. Um, so, so you're really just balance, balancing your ability to heat water um, at at to temperature instantaneously. Um, you know, gas does that quite quickly and efficient or well, efficiently, but um, it, you, you could you could produce quite a lot of heat um, using gas. So I think it, it's really just the technologies that have been available um, in the last few decades, and and we, that's what we're working with. Um, but that's a really interesting question. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, Morgan Sitoli, I'm allowing you to talk. Please ask your question and switch on your mic. Admit. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Um, one of the elements which we've been seeing is that uh, there have been so many strategies, and most of them lack that cohesiveness. And actually, what you need to do is to integrate all these initiatives and actually concentrate on the ones that will really give you a, a, ma a massive maximum benefit out of all these strategies. If you look now, we're going into uh, uh, smart meters. People are moving away in some into solar uh, power generation on rooftops. And even the target of the smart meters, it's unfortunately not in a prioritized in the specific areas which will give maximum benefit. And in addition to that, you are moving into this time of use and uh, market systems. All these have got their own uh, sort of pros and cons. Uh, because if you recall in ESCOM, there was a massive move towards uh, solar, heat solar heating and that was kind of abandoned. And even demand side management was one of the key areas which we emphasized, but it's moved away from that. Now the target even now is we're going to spend $2 billion <laughs> on smart meters. In some instances, if you look in the townships, uh, there's no benefit of putting a smart meter in the township because the, the, the use of electricity is very standardized and you're not going to benefit much in putting a smart meter, which will cost you more than uh, 30, 40,000. And I don't know who's going to pay for it. But my question is, can't all these uh, initiatives be put together in a more strategic and cohesive manner that will really give uh, uh, the country a lot of benefit? And one of the other aspects is, of course, that uh, uh, the, the, the systems which we're trying to put in themselves uh, uh, there, are, there are a lot of shifting, there are changes in technology and all, all, the, all the initiatives which are coming in. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Morgan. I think, uh, Theo, this is right in your in your court, uh, you know, the policy level uh, about energy efficiency, the cohesiveness of, of, of the work that is being done and, uh, and, and how to get the biggest bang for the buck uh, at a national level. What are your thoughts, Theo? Well, so before I get into that, just to, just to answer the previous question, so um, utilities hate instantaneous water heaters um, all, of, all over the world because of that, that, that draw, that instantaneous draw. The other thing is uh, regulations ha are sitting in front of the minister, uh, VC9113, for I3 motors to be um, um, minimum standard, minimum performance standards, and we're hoping that uh, those will be signed by Minister Patel in, as soon as possible to come into effect, just to, to answer that question about high speed. In terms of the, the cohesiveness, yes, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's, it's so tricky with, um, um, with all of these programs. And to an extent, ESCOM did a good job in bringing these things together. But as a utility, uh, they had a, a, a conflict at the time. So when the supply came back, they sort of gave up on the DSM program and there were other factors as well um, uh, that, 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 that influenced that. But they did have uh, a more integrated program uh, where they were all together. So this is why we're arguing at, at, the, at the highest, if there's a policy signal and that leads to funding and actions and targets, then you get that cohesiveness 
uh, coming uh, through. At the moment, it's uh, sort of uh, piecemeal and um, bits and pieces coming together, and you're not going to have that until we get buy in at the most senior level. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we're now going to go to Paul for Milan. Paul, I'm allowing you to talk. So you switch on your mic, and then we're going to have one last question, Tony uh, Langer, and then we'll call it a day. Thanks, Chris. I think the, the one question I wanted to ask was, is Theo would be residential tariffs where there's a maximum demand charge that would apply? Um, in previous viewings of, of the presentation, and it's excellent work, Jesse, that comeback load is the thing that we've really got to tackle. And I know Treasury are now going to spend 2 billion rand on smart meters. So, so maybe we should tell the smart meter that it also must do maximum demand penalty or something along those lines. Um, and then the other one I wanted to ask Theo was any any work done on refrigeration? Because I think refrigeration is now the second biggest consumer in household. It used to be geysers, lighting, and then fridges. But I think uh, fridges have now gone up a, a step. And just ask a couple of your mates, how many of them have got a, a, a fridge in the garage that's got just one six-pack of beer in it? There's probably quite a few like that. And apparently all the all the fridges that are older than I think it's 16 or 17 years before that gas change happened are very inefficient. So just a question, are we going to look at fridges? Thanks. Yeah, that, uh, you know, Jesse and Ken, you're going to have to do a study on how many bachelors are there out there who have just a six pack of beer in their fridge and how much it's costing to cool that six pack. It's a wonderful research topic, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, but Theo, you want to just tackle that question uh, for what it is. Yeah. So Time of use tariffs. Uh, what about time of use tariffs for the residential? So Okay, so let me ask, uh, give you my uh, perspective on both. So I'm not sure what the finance minister is thinking around it. In, in reading it, he's trying to help the, the municipalities that are in arrears by putting in these meters. I guess it's to control households and better um, collection uh, facilities. I think the program that ESCOM is running on load limiting has captured government's imagination. So during uh, periods of low supply, constrained supply, they uh, send a message to households and say you can't use more than 10 amps. If you do, the whole system trips but at least you've got 10 amps you can carry on. So maybe that's what they're thinking around the um, um, uh, the, the, the smart meters. Um, with regard to refrigeration, the MEPs are supposed to be um, strengthened. The second uh, uh, round, are, are, and again, they're sitting with the minister, they've been there since 2019. So we're really, really struggling uh, to get these through. We managed to get the, the lighting through, and that's great. Uh, but we've got to, more work that needs to be done. And uh, all of this is in the map that was uh, developed by the DMRE and the DFE. Um, and again, so it's just to say that a lot of work is being done, but we've got to get it at, um, at higher levels. Thank you. Thanks. Look, I'm yeah. going to take a last question. I see that there's there's another two qu uh, hands up, but... Let's take the last, we have to call it a day somewhere, and this is where I'm calling it a day. The last uh, question from Christopher Ramble. Uh, Christopher, please, uh, I'm allowing you to talk, switch on your mic. Uh, thanks, Chris. It's more a, a, a comment than a question. Um, I have two geezers at my house, and I've put the two geezers, their water circuits are in series with each other. So the 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 and they're staggered these two geezers. So the lower one takes the cold water in, hot water from that geezer goes into the second geezer, and the second geezer then supplies hot water to the to our system. And I've found that this has actually saved us probably around about twenty five percent of our electricity use on the geezer, mm -hmm. just putting them in series. Just a comment. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much for that comment. Look, I think we're going to call it a day there. I'm sorry there have been is uh, some more questions that are being asked, but some point we've got to do a cutoff and and this is it i just want to thank uh, finally uh, you know the uh, the presenters for their wonderful contributions today both in terms of their presentations themselves uh, as well as uh, you know fielding the question and answers so so professionally and competently uh, also i'd like to thank um, uh, you know the, the people who've supported us in producing this uh, webinar uh, that is african energy and daba actom john thompson um, uh, IWC, uh, Unlimited Energy, and WIT University. Uh, thank you, your organizations, for your support, for allowing your people to talk.
to us and to the audience. Uh, I think it's been very valuable. I've learned a lot, and I hope the audience has uh, too. It's given a lot of food for thought, and I hope the policymakers, uh, NECOM, uh, and the presidency and the DMRE have taken note of the things that are being said. We will be sharing all the presentations. The link to the video will all go out tomorrow. Thanks for your time uh, and attendance today as uh, the audience. You've been a wonderful audience with great questions. Uh, so all the best and cheerio from me.